Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my super rich friend insults us on her wealth building podcast and tells her listeners to stay away from average people. My bestie since childhood, let's call her Jenny, has her finances secured. She, who's 35 years old, built and made an exit from a business making her insanely rich. She comes from a very humble background and I can confidently say that she has earned it by working for it. I come from a pretty average background and I have a pretty average job today. So do most of our friends. I don't miss anything and I do have savings. I can go on trips, etc. Her story is a fairy tale and we're all super proud of her. But a couple of years ago, she was approached by an agency that pushed her to become a public motivational speaker and a podcaster. Since then, she has become increasingly unbearable to be around and I eventually came to the point where I needed to tell her. Since Jenny got rich, she has always been herself, just in a more fancy package and I've loved that for her. You go, girl. She has always been super respectful about other people's finances and when we meet up, she's always up for whatever the rest of us can afford. Even on her bachelorette party, she made a deal about making sure to do things everyone could afford. When pursuing her journey as a motivational speaker and a podcaster, I had to revisit everything I thought about her. All of her motivational tips were related to not wanting to be an average person and that anyone can become just as rich as her if they weren't lazy. In one episode, she talks about making sure to surround oneself with successful people to avoid looking at average people as an acceptable norm. She even went as far as describing another friend's husband as her nightmare partner as he lacks ambition. She didn't mention him by name, but other details that made us able to identify him. Over time, this worsened and eventually other people stopped inviting her to things. Now the podcast took another turn and she started to talk about how to handle when people turn their back on you for becoming successful and how lonely it is at the top. I decided it was time to tell her that I think she's losing grip of reality and that if she continues with being so judgmental in her podcast, she will end up just as lonely as she describes herself to be. Jenny got super upset with me and told me she wouldn't expect this from her best friend and claims I've been jealous and felt inferior to her my whole life, which is absolutely not true. She tells me the whole podcast thing is her playing a part and that she exaggerates her opinions for reach. She thinks I'm the one who has convinced all the others to leave her side and wants me to apologize before ever speaking to me again. Help me here. Am I the jerk? Should I apologize? Not the jerk. She's not lonely because she's at the top. She's lonely because she has lost all touch with humanity. Not the jerk. She sounds insufferable. I know several people who are wealthy enough to never have to work again for a single day in their lives, but they also happen to be some of the most humble people I know. Jenny seems like one of those main character syndrome folks who made it to the top of the mountain, so to speak, and now has to yell at the top of her lungs to let everyone know. The problem is that in this metaphor, she is also rolling boulders down that hill that affect the lives of those people who are still striving to better themselves. Consider not apologizing to her. She's better off learning that her behavior will alienate the friend she had. It looks like she was able to keep herself humble until she got in touch with these people who thought they could make money through her and fed her with crap about how she is inherently better than everyone else because she has money. Which is not hard to do when society has been drip fed this for the last 50 years at least. Now she's finding out but she's internalized so much of this crap that instead of, oh my goodness, I'm antagonizing everyone in my life, she just goes to, it's lonely at the top. Not the jerk. Maybe Jenny needs a reminder that money can't buy everything. If the podcast is costing her all of her friends, she's paying a very high price indeed. If she's willing to trade actual, real friends for likes, she's reaping what she has sown. No jerks here. What you and your friends are missing here is that her target audience is people who are on the same journey she has been on, business owners and entrepreneurs who are determined to build tremendous wealth. There's nothing wrong with being average, but please understand that average was not what she wanted to be, nor what her listeners desire to be. She achieved her goal and now she's helping others do the same. Just because she's your friend does not mean you need to be listening to her podcast, especially if it's going to upset you. If Michael Jordan did a podcast helping basketball players who were on the road to the NBA, he wouldn't tell them to surround themselves with average players who don't take the game seriously. What your friend is saying has been said by countless other speakers because there is a certain level of truth to it. And most importantly, if she truly believes in surrounding herself with above average people, then she in fact sees you as above average. You don't have to be wealthy to be an above average person. 
How we treat others is what determines who we are, not our net worth. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. I prefer to surround myself with below average people. Why do you think I married Reddit boy over here? Am I the jerk for telling my mother-in-law I'll pay for my wedding myself if she can't respect my few wishes? I, 25 male, will be marrying my fiance, G, who's 25 female, later on this year. I proposed to her a little bit before Christmas and we're aiming for a November wedding. G has two older brothers, only one of who has been married. And for one reason or another, my mother-in-law, who's 68, was not involved in the planning of their wedding at all. She was pretty hurt over this and she's always wanted to help plan her kids' weddings. So when we got engaged, she offered to pay for most of the wedding. And in return, we agreed to let her help with the planning. In my mind, as long as I'm marrying G, I'm happy, so I was okay with this. The only thing I'm really sticking to that I refuse to change is what I'm wearing. My mother passed when I was very young, and she was the daughter of first-generation Scottish immigrants. My grandparents moved from the north of Scotland in the 60s, and my mother was brought up learning about her parents' culture. Since she passed, I've had a hard time connecting to that side of my family, and after my grandfather passed a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to wear her family's kilt when I got married. I talked about this with my fiancé before we got engaged because it is an unorthodox idea, but she thought it was sweet and liked the idea. A few days ago, my mother-in-law came up to me and told me I'd have to wear a traditional tuxedo instead of a kilt. When I asked her why, she said it went against the view she had of G's wedding and that the colors of the kilt clashed with the colors she had chosen for the wedding. When I told her that this was pretty much the only thing I'm unwilling to budge on, she brought up how she's paying for most of the wedding and wearing a tux is the least I could do. When I brought this up to G, she echoed the sentiment her mother had made about paying for the wedding. I'm able to pay for it myself, and I told G that I thought she understood how important this connection to my mother was to me, especially because she can't be there, and if she wasn't able to accept that, then I'd pay for the wedding myself. G told me I was being a bit of a jerk for being this stuck to what I want to wear, and once my mother-in-law heard that I would just pay for the wedding myself, she got really upset because it's always been her dream to plan G's wedding. I'm feeling like a bit of a jerk right now and was wondering if I should just wear a standard tux. My family's kilt is really important to me, but this is causing more conflict than I thought it would. Update. I took most people's advice and I talked to my fiancé about this issue before going forward. Her siding with her mother like this and going against me was really out of character, so I felt like I really needed to figure out what was on the go. The long and short of it came down to money. G doesn't make as much of a salary as I do. I make about 2.5 times her salary. Despite this, she's pretty insistent of things being 50-50 between us. Our finances aren't combined until after marriage because of some weird tax issue and legal things in our home region. But even with me making more, she insists we're a team and have to go 50-50 on big things. Rent, car payments, electrical, wedding, etc. So even though I'm able to pay for the wedding myself, she's not able to pay for the half she feels like she'd have to pay. Because of this, she's really clinging to the idea of her mother paying for our wedding, even though I'd be more than happy to pay for it myself. We talked yesterday evening, and she said that since she accepted her mother paying for the wedding, their relationship has become pretty strained, with mother-in-law pretty much taking over the wedding planning. Apparently, mother-in-law was initially pushing for a tropical destination wedding in Jamaica, an idea that G put down quickly as she knows I hate the idea of a destination wedding, and mother-in-law had even tried to get final say on the dress that G was going to wear, as well as she wanted final say over who the bridesmaids were. She wanted her friend's daughters, who G is not even close to in the party. I've had a pretty good relationship with mother-in-law so far, so I found it kind of odd how she went total momzilla. But I have noticed her and G drifting apart a bit, although I never thought it was related. A few people thought that G actually hated the idea of the kilt and had mother-in-law acting as the bad guy to try and change my mind, and you're not completely wrong. She doesn't hate the idea, but really doesn't like that the other male members of the bridal party will be wearing tuxes while myself and my cousin would be wearing kilts. She wanted consistency across the board and had expressed this to her mother. Mother-in-law took this as the opportunity to get me to wear a tux instead of getting the groomsmen to wear kilts and had the wedding colors changed, without G's knowledge, to contrast with my family's. When I talked to G yesterday, she said that she had just gotten out of a massive fight with her mother over changing the colors and really wasn't in the mood to start another argument with her. She acknowledged she was in the wrong for siding with her mom and seemed genuinely sorry. She said that in the stress of planning a wedding while having an overbearing mother, she had thought of the kilt as another detail and had forgotten the significance of it to me and that she was really sorry. In the meantime, a few changes have been made. 
My mother-in-law is no longer paying for the wedding and no longer involved in planning. I'm going to pay half as G never wanted me to pay more than half by myself for something that's for both of us and my father-in-law is covering the parts that G is going to have some trouble covering. Mother-in-law is aware of this. Father-in-law and mother-in-law are still together. However, he's not telling her that he's helping to pay. We're still getting married in November. Wedding colors have been changed back to match my kilt and we've decided to rent kilts in matching colors for the other groomsmen so that they can match the aesthetic. Thankfully, no deposits were put down on things like tux rentals, bridesmaids dresses, or decorations, so no money lost. I know a lot of people told me to seriously reconsider marrying G, and going into our talk last night, I really was. But I'm happy with how things turned out, since this really was an anomaly in her behavior, and I really am excited to marry her. This should be a really good learning lesson, and the point of it is, should the wedding take place? The only opinions and wants that matter in this relationship seem to be of your mother-in-law and significant other. Are you willing to be an afterthought in your own marriage? Tell mother-in-law that if she wants to see a standard tux at your wedding so much, she should wear one. Not the jerk. And you're getting a glimpse right now of how life will be if you marry this person. You told her one thing was important to you and she could do whatever she wants for everything else. She ostensibly agreed and now your needs are immaterial and you're a jerk for wanting anything at all your way. You will be making a huge mistake marrying this person. Your mother-in-law will stomp all over your boundaries and more importantly, your wife doesn't give a hoot how you feel and will happily join her mom in stomping on them and then go darvo on you and make it like she's the victim and you are being a jerk to have any wants or needs. This is Red Flag City. Walk away or you will regret it. I absolutely guarantee it. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his mother-in-law? Please let us know. I asked my boyfriend's mom to teach me some recipes and all heck broke loose. My boyfriend Dan and I have been together for a little over two years. No relationship is perfect, but ours is basically as good as it can be. A little conflict, maximum happiness, everything is wonderful, yada yada yada. My family adores him and his dad seems to like me just fine, but for some reason his mom, Carol, has never been too fond of me. I don't push too hard, I'm really respectful whenever I'm around her. I bring her gifts for birthdays and holidays. She's never given me one. Not that I care. It's just kind of strange since I've been around for a while. Always trying to help when I can, etc. And yet, she's always been fairly cold to me. Not outright rude or terrible, just cold. I kind of wrote it off, figuring she's just a tough nut to crack. Anyway, my boyfriend and I recently finished our master's degrees and were feeling bored with our jobs and figured, what the heck, let's move to a different country. When we told the families, everyone was ecstatic for us except Dan's mom, which really wasn't surprising. We both have jobs lined up, so it's not like we'll be bumming around or anything. Not that there's anything wrong with traveling. I'm a huge advocate. So the only reason she's not on board with it is because Dan won't be living 25 miles away from her anymore, even though it's a great opportunity for both of us and something he's been wanting to do for a while. We leave in a few weeks, so we've been trying to spend time with them as much as we can. Dan knows about how his mom treats me and even though she's not rude to me, he said that he's talked to her about whether or not she likes me, to which she'll reply, She's fine. I'm perfectly nice to her. So like I said, she's not terrible. She's just not great, to the point where I'd never ask Dan to bash her or anything. It just makes me sad, because I want to be close with his family because they mean a lot to me. So I've been making some efforts to hang out with her. Anyway, we were over at his mom's house for dinner this weekend, and I offered to help her in the kitchen, to which she reluctantly obliged. Now, she's a decent cook, but in no way is she an amazing chef or anything. Never mention secret recipes or anything like that, but I thought it would be a nice gesture to ask her to teach me some of her recipes. So while I was chopping onions, I said, Hey Carol, I was wondering if you would teach me some of your recipes. Dan loves your cooking, and I would love to cook for him when we're abroad to remind him of home since I know he'll miss your cooking. Then she stopped and walked out of the room. It was super awkward, so I waited around a bit. When she finally came back in, she started yelling at me about how out of line I was. She was saying stuff like, How dare you? You think you can replace me? And all of this crazy stuff. I was completely shocked and dumbfounded. I immediately walked out and told Dan, who was heading into the kitchen to see what the commotion was about, that I would be leaving. He told me to wait in the car because he was really confused. I sat there for three minutes when he came out apologizing, saying his mom was completely in the wrong, so we left. So here I am a few days later, very confused. I'm happy Dan stuck up for me, but this situation is so ridiculous, I have no idea where to go from here. He's currently not speaking to his mom, 
but has received texts from his dad apologizing and chalking his mom's freak out due to the stress of Dan leaving soon. I don't want to be the reason he severs his relationship or anything, but I also feel pretty disrespected over something so silly. Any advice on how to handle this? She feels threatened that you're replacing her as the woman in Dan's life. That's why she reacted the way she did when you asked about the recipes. This is something she has to deal with on her own because she seems like a very overprotective mother that hasn't grasped the concept that her son is an adult. OP. Thank you. I totally get that she may feel threatened that I'm taking her son away, but I want the opposite. I think that's why I'm so hurt. The last thing I want to do is pull him away from his family and then in an effort to get closer to her, she pushed me away and accused me of something ridiculous. Just No Mother-in-Law is full of these stories of loony moms who have unhealthy relationships with their sons. For the most part, they are really funny. How dare you? You think you can replace me? This, however, is disturbing. I mean, he's 27 years old already. At least Dan stood up for you right away. OP. It's crazy to me because Dan always mentioned she was overbearing, but not anything like this. Dan is super independent and just about as much of a mama's boy as any normal guy who loves his mom. So this whole possessive thing came out of nowhere. It even freaked Dan out a bit. But yeah, he's a great guy. It sounds like Dan's mom is having an episode of a combination empty nest syndrome and massive jealousy. She feels like you're taking her son away, that she's losing him, and that you're trying to replace her. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do. Dan's response was appropriate, and should this sever some ties, it's not your fault. If you really want, you can try to reach out to Carol in a non-confrontational way. Shoot her a thoughtfully worded email, but I would avoid apologizing as you haven't done anything wrong. Maybe something like this. Carol, I wanted to reach out to you to discuss what happened the other night. It was not my intention to upset you or make you feel like you're being replaced. We're both going to miss you and Dan's dad very much when we're abroad and I was hoping to find a way to feel closer to you. I love Dan and being able to have a relationship with you is important to me because I know how important you are to him. Update. I definitely sympathized with her because I know it must be scary to have your only kid, yes, Dan is their only kid, as a lot of you guessed, pulled away by another woman, even though we have completely different relationships. But regardless, it doesn't excuse what she did so I let Dan initially reach out to her, to which I followed up later. Dan gave her a call and was very nice, yet firm with her on how she treated me. Carol responded saying that she was really embarrassed and sorry and that she felt terrible and wanted to give each of us some time to cool off before reaching out. I initially told Dan that I wanted to send her an email based on what one Redditor drafted, so he told her that I would reach out when I was ready because I really wanted to frame the conversation rather than have her feel like complete crap for her outburst. So I sent her a text later in the evening and we met for breakfast this morning. She was so apologetic and cried and I said that although it did hurt me that I understood where she's coming from and I in no way am trying to replace her. I respect her a lot because she raised my literal dream man. So even though we may not be best friends, she's done a lot of things right. We hung out for a bit and did things wonderfully with a redo invitation to cook together this weekend, her recipes and hugged goodbye. All is right in the world. Am I the jerk for not paying any more of her tuition unless she can give me the time of day and show me some respect? I want to start off by saying that I've done everything for my kids. I was there at the hospital for their births, signed the birth certificates, I changed diapers and always provided them with food and designer clothes. But my ex is extremely manipulative and has tried to turn my kids against me since day one. She manipulated my older daughter who refused to talk things out with me. I will still forgive her once she finally decides to snap out of my ex's manipulations and come back to me. Me and my younger daughter, Sarah, had a great relationship until she suddenly flipped the switch in her senior year and also was turned against me. When Sarah was applying for college, I really didn't want her to go far because she has book smarts but lacks common sense and I didn't want her to fall for scams. I even offered to buy her a car if she lived with me and commuted to a local school. But Sarah just said that the local programs didn't have what she wanted. I found it insulting because I went to a local college and despite what my ex thinks, I am highly educated without some PhD. Sarah did not listen to my input at all. Her and my ex barely involved me in her college application process. My ex was extremely unhelpful. I would just ask basic questions like tuition since I was going to spend considerable funds and she would just send website links. It would have only taken a few seconds for her to just answer the questions so I could stay in the loop about what's going on. But this was just part of my ex's way of turning Sarah against me. Sarah enrolled at an out-of-state college and I didn't even find out until May because my ex didn't bother telling me. 
I didn't even get to see Sarah off at the airport since she didn't tell me she had left until after she was already gone. I constantly text Sarah asking how things are going. I send her funny posts on Facebook and ask her to call me. I even offer to split the cost of plane fare so Sarah could come visit over the holidays. She only responds on email and it's always her saying she's too busy. I'm frustrated and tired of this. She's taking a lot of classes right now, but I'm her father and it would only take a second of her day to just text me back or talk to me on the phone for five minutes. I've supported and been providing for Sarah since day one. I'm done being disrespected when I've bent over backwards for 18 years to give her everything and have sent $7,000 just this year for her schooling. I could be doing a million other things with that money. Maybe I am at fault for enabling it for so long, but not anymore. I sent an email telling her that I'm done with being disrespected, and if she can't even give me the time of day, then my ex can find someone else to split the cost of her schooling with. I sent the email over two hours ago, and there's been no response. I know my wording might seem harsh, but I'm just so done with being disrespected. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. The way you talk about the women in your life is upsetting, concerning. Of course you paid for everything your kid needed during her childhood. That was your responsibility. You don't get a trophy for supporting the kids you chose to bring into the world. You aren't special. Now that she's 18, you could cut her off if you wanted to. But you'd be stupid to think that she's going to come crawling back to play by your manipulative rules with all the hugs and kisses for her daddy. She'll just do what most of us had to do. She'll take out loans to cover what you stopped paying. You'll probably never see her again. Forget about her potential future kids. You won't be their grandfather. I don't think your wife had to turn your kids against you. I think you did that all by yourself. Sounds like the ex didn't have to turn the kids against him. They just realized how terrible of a person he is on their own. And of course, classic narcissist, it couldn't have possibly been the consequences of his own actions. This reeks of missing reasons. If you're not legally obligated to contribute to her education, you can do as you please. But you're this close to living the rest of your life as if you'd never had kids. And they won't be the ones regretting their choices. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. It comes across as you resenting your ex's education level and trying to weaponize your daughter to follow the path you took rather than the one they took, regardless of what your daughter wanted and ever since then your relationship has suffered for it. You also take zero accountability for anything you might have done to make these relationships go south and just chalk it up to brainwashing. You can withhold the tuition money if you want, but it'll just be another daughter you never speak to again. Not the jerk. In general, nobody should seek advice from Reddit but especially if you're male. For guys, the sentiment here will always be that you are in the wrong just because you're a dude. Your ex-wife, your daughters, your employees, they will always be the victims of what a horrible person you are. The only way you can get Reddit to side with you is by making yourself out to be the weakest dude possible, one who lets others walk all over him, disrespect him, and take advantage of him. I just saw a post the other day where the guy starts out by saying, let me start by saying that I'm the dad who always allows the women in his life to tell him what to do. I'm basically their ATM machine at this point and I don't mind it because I wouldn't change a thing and I love my family. And guess what? He was voted not the jerk because that's what these people think you should be. The idea of leading your family is now frowned upon by society. You're now expected to be the provider who gets zero respect. I challenge you to find one TV show in the past 20 years where the father isn't made out to be some clown who's constantly condescended by his wife and kids. People have been programmed to think this way because when the shepherd is not respected or able to lead his flock, the flock is easier to lead astray. My son wants to go in your wheelchair. Get out so he can try it. I've been browsing this sub for a while and never thought I would post on here. Oh, how I was wrong. Backstory. I'm a 29-year-old female and have been confined to a wheelchair since I was 17. I'm a quadriplegic and can use a manual wheelchair at home but use a power wheelchair in public for practical reasons. I have mostly full use of my upper body and partial use of my lower body. I've been mistaken for a paraplegic a few times. This happened about a month ago. I was downtown shopping when I heard a deafening squeal of a kid who was about 12, entitled kid. Oh, that's a cool scooter. How fast does it go? Me. Thanks little man. Yeah, it goes pretty fast. Can I have a go? Me. Thinking he meant to sit in my lap and I drive him around, which in any other scenario I would have been happy to do, but not with everything going on right now. Sorry dude, but not today. The kid says, Ah, okay, and stomps away. And I thought that was the end of it, but you know, I wouldn't be here if it was. 
A few minutes later, I hear the ground start to tremble as the Megatron Karen approaches. Oh boy, I thought, this is going to be fun. Entitled Parent Excuse me, what did you say to my son? Me, confused. Uh, he wanted a ride in my wheelchair. I said no. What did you just say to me? You need to respect your elders and not talk down to my poor little angel. You don't even need that wheelchair. I know your legs work. You're just faking it to get attention. Now let my son have a ride. She couldn't have been much older than 35, so obviously not my elder. But even if my nan spoke to me like that, I wouldn't reply kindly. Me, all of my patients officially gone. My wheelchair cost more than your car, and you want me to miraculously heal out of my chair so your dirty little goblin can take a joyride? Okay. Goblin was smirking at me the entire time. Here's where the story gets graphic. I have hypermobility, which makes my joints extremely flexible and dislocation easy and relatively painless. I also have titanium screws inside my neck that creak loudly when I move a certain way. Bring on the Frankenstein. I lean forward, push down my right arm, dislocating my shoulder blade with a loud pop as I twisted my neck to make it creak, then push down with my left hand to contort my arm and hand into an unnatural position. This all happened in a few seconds, but it was enough to make Karen, red-faced and horrified, scream out, STOP! It's okay, entitled kid, let's go! And they hurried out of the store. I could hear laughter coming from behind me as a friend who works there walked up to me and said, That was mean. He knew me well and had seen me pull that trick before. Needless to say, I never had an issue like that again. It's a small town and news travels fast. Don't mess with the girl in the wheelchair. Entitled Aunt locks our house because she wants to sell it. So people really wanted to know the other story about my aunt. So backstory for those who haven't read the last one. I lived in my grandparents' house for 10 years. Both grandparents are past and there is no will so not sure what to do with the house. But grandma's wish before passing was not to sell the house. About my aunt, she's married to her husband who has his business abroad and has one boy of my age. He's a really sweet kid and I love him but she sent him to a boarding school for character development. So now, over to the actual story. Now when we were in the house, we had everything bad happen to us. We lost money, my dad got his leg hurt under a bus, he also had cancer, I got depression and anxiety, my dad lost his job, etc, etc. So basically, a bad omen. We moved about a year ago, and I kid you not, our life instantly became perfect, like amazing. See, the only reason we had to make trips back and forth in that house was because our old house was 220 square yards and our current home is 110 square yards, so we couldn't fit all of our furniture in it. So my grandma passed a few weeks ago and after her passing, my aunt, who is very hungry for money, has been trying to get my other psycho aunt convinced to sell the house, but they won't have a home after that, so she denies. Now, that lady at least wants to sell our floor. The house has great value so she really wants to get the money from it. Her husband returned from Thailand, where he lives, to attend the Chautha, something done to pay final respects to someone. Now, we didn't go home, so we have no idea what the heck went on there, but my psycho aunt, who was kind of concerned, told us that the aunt came with her husband and he put locks on our house, hence stopping us from doing anything in it. We had to get new stuff for our new home that we're gonna move to in May and wanted to keep those things in that house because we have no space where we're living. Now, my aunt told my mom about this when we went there to accept the delivery, but mom and dad went to a locked house. She was restricting us from getting our personal property. There are books, tables, cabinets, almiras, and whatnot in that house. We can't get any of it now, just because that jerk thinks she's entitled to that house and our stuff. My mom's relatives, except for my grandma and grandpa, don't like my dad for some reason. It's a long story. Now let me tell you what, my dad is the sweetest human being I know. He's there to protect us. He handles whatever insults my mom's relatives throw at him. He works really hard for us. He gives us every luxury, even in dire times and whatnot. I don't know why they don't like him. He's such a nice man. I literally had to protect him at my grandma's funeral so that no one would say anything to him and I was ready to fight if anyone did. Anyway, my dad didn't get angry or anything but simply said this, when we'll be able to move out, We'll take everything and never come back ever again. Everyone agreed. Now, we had totally let this go 
because we know how crazy of a person that entitled lady and her husband are. But about a week ago, my mom received a call. My friend usually called at the time, so I thought it would be her, but it was the aunt. She had been drinking and was saying some senseless things. Here's how the conversation went. Aunt, I have filed a police report against you and you will get arrested if you try to break the locks. Me, that doesn't make any sense. We have just as much a right as you do over that house. Aunt, you and your husband will not come near that house and stop telling Aunt two crazy stories about not selling. Me, realizing she thinks I'm my mom. We're not saying anything to her. You're insane. And your husband. I will make him pay and he will suffer. At this point, I have had enough and just want to make her shut up. I have no respect for her now and I just went off. I have never ever said anything bad to her before, but yeah. Me. Okay, now I can't take it. If you ever call here again, you will face consequences. You are no longer welcome to call here and I will straight up block you. So here's the thing. My sister is the kind of person who has had to shut this woman up a lot of times, so she thought I was her. My sister is 23. She calls me by my sister's name. You jerk. Give the phone to your mom. This instant. She is my sister and I have a right to talk to her. Me. I'm OP. You just swore at a kid. Aunt starts stuttering. No, you're lying. You can't be OP. I know it's not. So she has a very sensitive ego and the thought of being told off by a kid just broke her. Me. It is me. And now don't ever call us again, you idiot. Bye. I disconnected the call and blocked her. I don't know what scene will be created once we break the locks, but my mom and dad were proud of me for what I did. The fact that I was the one who said all of this broke her completely. Dad was really angry that she swore at me and said I did good by not stooping to her level. Also, I was talking in front of my mom and even though she knows I swear, she's never heard me do it and I don't want to scar her. Entitled parents think they own the ski lift at a major resort. Long ago, when I was but a wee lad, so like a couple of months ago, I was skiing with a friend at a resort quite close to my home in the vastness of the universe, but that is besides the point of this story, so I will dive right into it. My friend and I had decided to take a break from our studies at our university and go on a pleasant ski trip. What fun! We had skied most of the day with fair weather, fresh snow, and a few lift lines. Unfortunately, there is one lift that is cursed. For lines plague this lift each and every hour of the 8-hour ski day, the dreaded T-bar, the terror of the beginner skier. Anyways, we pizza stopped our way to the back of the line and waited our turn like any pair of gentlemen would. During this wait, I glanced at the sign in the queue ahead and noticed it said alternate in very large red letters. This sign is of great importance to the story, so please take note. Anyways, as we wait, a group of three a large man in a blue 80s style ski jacket with the most appalling yellow boots, a woman with three braids of hair sticking from the back of her studded motorcycle helmet, and a kid who appeared quite young and seemingly unready to partake in the conquest known as the T-Bar comes skiing down the slope. This strange group approached from our left, nonchalantly ducked under the rope indicating the formation of the line, literally pushed my friend backwards and took place directly in front of us as a group of three. Now, I'm not sure how much any of you dear readers know of T-bars, but they can only seat two. So my friend and I are perplexed over this turn of event, and I grew more and more frustrated as we progress. So, to alleviate my growing anger, I say, Excuse me, I believe you cut in line. The back is near the back. As if the back could not be any clearer. 80s daredevil wannabe dad. Shut up! Heavily accented with a deep southern twang. My friend, how about you shut up? and wait your turn. The group did not reply, but the entitled leather-clad mother looked back at us and gave us the mitten. By that, we think she may have been trying to give us a mean gesture, but found it difficult to do so in mittens. We progressed. My friend and I are talking very loudly about entitled people and amateur skiers, blah blah blah. Then it came time to alternate with the line next to us. Two lines filled with people become one, each line switching off. So naturally, the entitled gang skis right over the skis of the woman whose turn it was and off into the blue. Now singular line. This woman, who we will call Marjorie, because that's a dope name and she was a dope lady, tells them off and the crusty 80s macho man gives his classic response. Marjorie turns to us and asks, Are they in ski school? They must be. Ski schoolers have a special line to bypass standard crowds, 
but only under direct supervision of a ski instructor. Me. They must be. However, they probably just paid more for their lift tickets than we did. They didn't. We all pay the same amount. Marjorie laughs and we proceed to have a nice conversation about how idiotic the people in front of us are, very loudly. Perhaps to the extent of overreaction, but hey, we were having fun. Their turn gets here. But wait, you can't have three people on a single bar. So the dad scoops his kid up and holds him. This is a no-no. The lift operators stop the lift and ask that they separate accordingly. So Miss Triple Braid Mom scoots back so she can take the following bar up the mountain alone. The operators turn the lift back on and the bar swoops in and is placed on the kid's lower back. Now, this bar is perfectly leveled for the kid, but it barely comes to the father's mid-thighs. So not only is he stooped over like a gorilla, but he is now terribly off balance. The woman catches our bar just fine and seems comfortable, but as the hunchback of Mississippi, aka the yellow booted cookie monster, is carried up the mountain, his position looks more and more precarious. It is worth mentioning, at this point my friend and I are securely holding onto the bar and being carried up the mountain behind Marjorie and her companion. So the fall. This is wonderfully terrible in so many ways. I will try my best to explain this in perfect detail. The father compensates for the bar by hunching forward, meaning his center of mass is forward. The ski's binding can only hold so much weight. Crack! The binding released the boots, as any safe binding should, and the man falls on his face into the snow. His feet swipe up into the air. Some of you may know this fall to be called a scorpion, and his skis slide backwards down the slope, parallel for some time, before careening off into the adjacent slopes. The mother, in a desperate attempt to avoid her face-planted partner, swerves rightward and ends up with her skis stuck in a rut. She immediately loses balance and tumbles to the side, still holding onto the bar. Her husband, who is now sliding downward, grabs her by the leg as she passes to the right. She holds for a second or two until she too falls and now the two of them are sliding downward towards Marjorie who gives out a resounding, for heaven's sake, as her and her companion tumble over the pair of line cutters. My friend and I decide to get off here to avoid the calamity ahead. From the sidelines we watch as the mess of people grows larger and larger as people look for lost skis, lost poles, and lost dignities. From here, my friend and I leave, but not before I notice the one person who made it through this gargantuan-sized mess, the kid of the entitled parents, casually being pulled up the slope, glancing backward at the mess their parents had caused. I don't work here. I don't even live in this state. I'll be referring to my grandmother in the German term for grandmother, which is Oma. Now this happened some years ago when I had just turned 15. My Oma invited me to Colorado to visit her for a while and I was all for that since I didn't see her too often. A couple days into my stay, we went to buy some groceries. As my Oma was at the other end of the aisle, I was given permission to look for some cereal I might like. That was when I heard someone to the side of me ask for some help. Now I am pretty shy and usually try to avoid contact with people, but when someone needs help, I gladly jump in to assist them. Excuse me, little miss. Would you mind helping me grab this bag of cereal? I can't reach it. A little old lady got my attention. Sure, no problem. Now, I'm not considered amazingly tall. I'm just above average at 5 foot 5, but this lady was barely 5 feet. Just to reach the bag of cereal, I had to stand on my tiptoes and reach for it, but I managed to get it down and helped her put it in her cart. Thank you very much, young lady. God bless you, she said. It wasn't an issue. Do you need help with anything else? No, thank you. My son is actually shopping with me, but he had to run out to the car to get his wallet. Okay then, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I wave her off before turning around to go back to my Oma, who was still trying to make a decision whether to buy one thing or the other. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly what she held in her hands. Then suddenly, a rough tap on my shoulder prompted me to turn back around. My eyes met with this middle-aged lady who was wearing workout gear. She shall be named Karen, as it is only right in this sub. Excuse me? Do you know where the ice cream section is? Karen said. Seeing as I've only been following my Oma around and not paying attention, I could only respond, Um, I can't think of where it is. I haven't been here before. Oh, you're a new worker? Shouldn't you be accompanied by another person before helping people? She seemed curious. Realizing what Karen is thinking, I say, Oh no, I don't work here. You helped that old lady before. You can't lie. I saw it with my own eyes. She couldn't reach the cereal, so she asked me, since I'm taller. So you admit it. She let out an accomplished smile. 
I don't even know why she was satisfied with my answer. It wasn't like she really achieved anything. I did help her, but I'm not wearing a uniform. I was wearing a neon pink shirt with a cat on the front. Don't think that's uniform for any grocery store. You should ask yourself that. Why aren't you in uniform? Karen screamed at me. I don't have a uniform. I don't work here. After yelling that, I tried to walk away, but she stepped in front of me and bumped me back a bit. Is there a problem? My Oma strolled over due to my yelling. Stay out of this. I'm trying to get this idiot here to help me find the ice cream aisle. Now for some background about my Oma. She's an older lady who used to be in the Air Force and she's not afraid to speak her mind. She could be pretty intimidating due to the fact that she's over six feet tall. Did you just call my granddaughter an idiot? What gives you the right to talk to her that way? She seethed. She's impersonating a staff member. She is the one in the wrong. Karen went to grab me, but my Oma put her arm out in front of me. Are you joking or just foolish? Look at her. Where's her name tag? She's not even dressed in the right color for the uniform. My Oma didn't hold back her words. Like I was trying to tell you, I just helped the old lady get something that was too far out of her reach. I don't work here. I don't even live in this state. I'm just here to visit my grandmother. I gestured to my Oma. But, she said as she tried to reach around my Oma, attempting to make another grab at me. But a pretty big guy with huge muscles pushed his way in front of the lady and cut her off. Lady, leave the kid alone. If you put your hands on her, I will have no issues with arresting you. He said as he pulled out a badge, signifying he was a police officer. Her face turned white before she tried to defend herself. She was... Nope, don't say a word. Just walk away. It's not... She tried to speak again. Ma'am, I won't say it again. Stop fighting with me and leave her alone. He said with a stern voice, making Karen turn and walk away with her cart. After she left, we thanked the man, and as he was about to reply, a familiar voice called out. What's taking so long? Did you find the oatmeal I forgot? The nice old lady said as she rounded the corner. Well, hello again, young lady, she said with a pleasantly surprised smile on her face. Hello, ma'am. Sorry, mom. Some lady was pestering this girl. Didn't even know she was the one who helped you while I was away. He responded before turning to me. Thank you for helping my mother. I told her to wait for me to get back, but she is a little bit stubborn. Nice old lady playfully slapped him on the arm, making us laugh a bit. After that, we chatted with the two of them for a bit and explained to nice old lady what had just happened before saying our goodbyes. Funnily enough, we later went to the ice cream aisle without Karen in sight. Never had as much satisfaction eating ice cream as I did reminiscing about Karen's face when the man showed his badge. Don't break the rules and then insist your staff enforce them. Whilst I was at university, I worked in our students' hall, basically a two-story bar that was subsidized by the government. Because of the subsidy, it was the cheapest place in town, so we would get a couple locals come in. To prevent this, we were supposed to check everyone that had a student ID, but no one minded as the locals were usually polite and handled their booze better than most students. My manager, who was a local himself, would encourage locals to come and would either discourage ID checks or simply not inform new staff of the situation. He would often steal from the bar and would give free drinks to his mates. One night, he had a bunch of his buddies in town come in, having a drinking session at the bar's expense, paid for maybe one-fifth of the drinks, till way past closing and beyond our license. This resulted in the police being called for a noise complaint and his boss, Hall's Head, finding out. To cover his butt, he claimed that the groups were locals that we, the bar staff, had happily allowed to stay, and then fudged the accounting for the night to make up for the free drinks. Because of this, he himself demanded we check every student ID and the head took away some of our employee perks. The Sunday after this all went down, the pool tournament guys come in. These guys rotate which bar they go to every week between a list of maybe six that have enough pool tables and lounge space. I personally had served them a half dozen times. They make their way over to the bar and the first guy is well in his 40s. Me. Hey man, before I can serve you, I have to see your student ID. He chuckled and said something along the lines of, Do I look like a student? And proceeded to order. Me. Look, I'm sorry, but I've been told that if you haven't got a student ID, I can't serve you. He started to realize I wasn't just messing with him and looked at the other member of staff who reiterated the point. Him. Are you serious? We've been coming here for two years. Me. Yeah, sorry. Manager is cracking down on the only student's rule. I can grab my supervisor for you if you want. My supervisor was also a student and explained the situation, said he was sorry for the inconvenience and that if they had any complaints to call the head, my manager's boss, and even gave out a couple of his cards that were in his office. 
The pool guys left, which meant no one was really in the building, so we ended up closing early. Next morning, I awoke to my manager screaming down the phone at me, but it was my day off, so I hung up and didn't go to work as a customer till past noon. When I did, my coworkers couldn't wait to tell me what had happened. My manager had come in and had a shouting match with my supervisor in front of everyone grabbing a morning coffee. The head had indeed received some complaints and scheduled a meeting with the manager that morning. Not wanting to face it alone, he took my supervisor with him. I imagine intending to throw him under the bus as much as possible. The head was upset. A. Because all these 40-something men had called to complain on his personal number on a Sunday. B. Because these 40-something men, by their own admission, had been coming here for years at the invite of the manager whom they knew well. My manager tried to save face and claim they were associated with the university, that they were in fact lectures, that it was the bar staff's failing to check for student ID all the time, and then turned on my supervisor saying he had given them a bad reputation, cost them money by turning them away, and closing early as well as laying bare every other mistake he had ever made. My supervisor explained that it was never explained to staff that customers had to be students, as the manager actively encouraged locals to come in, that even lectures get a form of student ID, and explained to the head about the manager's drinking with his mates and the dodgy accounting he'd do. This led to the CCTV being checked. When the head saw that it was in fact the manager and his mates, that the bar staff rarely put anything through the tills at his request, suspended him on the spot. He then said the accounts would need to be audited and that he would likely be terminated and even prosecuted. After a surreal couple of weeks, we got our perks back. They hired a new manager and eventually they installed locks on the doors that could only be opened with a student ID. No idea what happened to the old manager, but by no means a loss. Entitled mom tried to sue my grandma for her house. My grandma had four kids, all were girls. My mom is one of the four and Entitled mom's mom was also one of the four. My grandpa passed and left everything to my grandma. My grandma has a will that divides everything equally to each of her kids, my three aunts and my mom. Entitled mom's mom, my aunt, passed away. Entitled mom has four younger siblings and she's the eldest, and my aunt's inheritance and included my grandma's current house. Entitled mom and my grandma both live together. Entitled mom is a horrible person. She drinks too much and goes out partying until 4 a.m. She has nowhere to live, so she ended up with my grandma. My grandma takes care of her kid as Entitled Mom goes out partying. Entitled Mom spoils her kid using family money, as in, she asks everyone to get stuff for the kid and has successfully managed to get this kid seven backpacks, three luggage cases full of clothing, which fits a whole closet in the house in the guest room. And this kid has managed to break four iPads slash tablets, all paid for by my mom. On top of that, Entitled Mom is severely obese. I don't know how these guys are so obsessed with her. Normally I wouldn't judge, but she has a kid that she never takes care of properly. She has managed to also get money from different family members for surgeries, including tummy tucks and liposuction. She loses all this weight, pretends to be better, then reverts back to her bad behavior. So with all of that out of the way, let me get into what she was doing. She went to the courts, suing my grandma. More recently, she claimed that my grandma was senile. My grandma is old, but her memory is not fading. She does not have any diagnosed dementia of any sort. The only thing she has is bad hearing. Now, my grandma was upset by getting sued, but she is very family oriented and continued to let Entitled Mom live in the house. It wasn't until Entitled Mom made the claim that my grandma was senile that she finally listened to everyone's plea to have Entitled Mom kicked out. So because Entitled Mom questioned my grandma's sanity and state of mind, they had a psychologist question both my grandma and Entitled Mom. Now, Entitled Mom was racking up money to bribe the judge to rule in her favor. It's a third world country and people are desperate, so normally a judge would easily take it. However, this judge didn't take it and the psychologist absolutely grilled Entitled Mom. According to her brother, who got roped into it unwillingly, he waited outside the room and could hear Entitled Mom yelling and crying and having a tantrum. Entitled Mom came out of the room crying. One of my aunts took my grandma to the psychologist and waited outside. This was the same psychologist that interviewed Entitled Mom. My grandma came out feeling fine. She wasn't like Entitled Mom. The courts denied Entitled Mom's claim that day, 
entitled mom was kicked out of the house with her kid. My grandma is sad to kick out the kid because it isn't his fault. However, entitled mom has been leeching off my grandma long enough. Everyone else has hated entitled mom for years and it was absolutely glorious hearing the news that the courts refused her claim to take my grandma's house and get the inheritance before my grandma passes. This isn't the first time Entitled Mom has tried to pull stuff like this, and I would happily tell the stories of how Entitled Mom managed to get so much money and gifts in great detail. What would you do if you had a family member suing your grandma? Let me know. Night of the Living Karens A little about me. I'm in charge of four retail shops that cater to sporting goods that heavily focuses on hunting, but it's not limited to hunting. I put in a full 16 hours checking inventory, doing the billing and payroll. I decided to stop and shop for dinner at Walmart. I walk in wearing a black shirt that says, my rights don't end where your feelings begin. I hit the pre-made salad in Sandwich Island. Nothing. I move around to the burrito area. I hear an ahem <coughs> behind me. I figured I was in the way and moved out of the way. I hear the annoyed ahem <coughs> again followed by an irate voice of a wild Karen. You should at least acknowledge me, sir. I look up and she begins to ask me if I am going to make any more sandwiches. I say, Madam, I don't work here. I do know, however, the sandwich people are gone for the day. They'll have more in the morning. She storms off talking to herself about how I was a rude associate. I shrug and continue shopping for my dinner. I move over to the pizza section and there's nothing. Yet, while there, I get yelled at by another Karen. She demanded to know why I was out of uniform. I politely tell her, Madam, I don't work here. I then mosey off before she can speak to me further. While walking away, I hear her gasp and explain loudly to someone that I was very rude to her. In the frozen food aisle, looking for at least a bag of french fries or tater tots or even a frozen pizza, I hear another <coughs> behind me. I push forward, thinking I am in the way again. I hear another <coughs> followed by a hand on my shoulder. It's a Chad and a Karen. Chad is the one grabbing my shoulder. I push his hand off and turn to face him, telling him not to touch me and to get away from me. He recoils in horror and his Karen gasps. He demands to speak to my manager. I tell him, I don't work here. You can talk to the manager all you want. I then walk away as they storm off to the customer service center. I finally find food for dinner, a frozen bag of veggies and frozen chicken strips in the next aisle. I move on and grab some trail mix for breakfast and lunch tomorrow for work. I head to the sporting goods section to look at their new materials. I can sometimes find cheaper items there than at my own shops. I buy three boxes of turkey pew pew materials, the last three there. I hear a chad behind me howl in disgust. Why are you buying those? You work here, paying customers first. Those are mine by right, he legit shouts. I turn and politely tell him, yes, paying customers first, and I am a customer who just bought them. I do not work here. His pet Karen chimes up. You certainly do work here. I see you here all the time. I explain, I don't work here. I am the owner of my business. I then walk away, leaving them fuming. The poor girl with the key to the pew pew material cabinet chimes up. He don't work here. They go off yelling at her about how she's covering for a thieving employee who's taking from customers to be a very rude and greedy person. I stop by office supplies and electronics to pick up some goodies. I then remember something from my list back in the food section. I go to get English muffins. I don't see the kind that I like, but I see the honey wheat ones and I grab three for the gazillion eggs I got at home. A wild Karen freaks out on me. You're an employee. You shouldn't be hoarding stuff. I politely tell her I do not work here and exasperatedly ask why does everyone think I'm an employee? I'm clearly not dressed like an employee. She comes back with, why else would you be in Walmart? I walk away laughing and retort, you must be a Walmart employee too. Why else would you be in Walmart? I'm looking over jewelry when Chad from Sporting Goods walks up and reaches into my carriage taking out my three boxes of turkey pew pews. This was seen by Mark. Mark is the 62-year-old store manager who is being followed by no less than 10 people, all pointing at me, saying that I was the rude employee who they had been snubbed by. The Chad caught red-handed claims I stole them out of his cart. 
Mark listens to them and all their complaints while keeping a smile. After they each said their piece, he proudly declares to the group, some of which had people who didn't even talk to me, upset about my choice of attire, that I do not work there and never have, that I am a regular customer but I own a number of sporting goods stores, and that he had bought products for his nephew to hunt with directly from me and saw me walk out of the office of the store. Many grumble and accuse him of playing favorites and protecting his employee, vowing to complain to corporate and never shop there again before disbanding. Mark turns to the Chad, still holding the three boxes of my turkey pew pews. You come with me. I follow Mark and Mark reviews the camera footage to determine who the boxes belong to. I even provide my receipt because I never walk away from sporting goods without paying. Mark turns to me and asks if I want to press charges. I agree and wait for the police. Chad is arrested and I fill out my witness statement. Mark does so as well and turns over a copy of the security footage and a photocopy of my receipt. I pay for my things and Mark compensated me with three bags of trail mix for the insanity of the store. We joke and exchange some talk about our respective businesses and the chaos. I wave and tell Mark I'll see him later and to drop by the shop that his new order had just come in and I'll throw in a goodie bag for him to thank him for the extra trail mix. I have survived the night of the living Karens in one piece. Never cheat for your kid. So back in high school, I was classmates with a kid who, well, wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Take note, we were sophomores, grade 10, by now, so our batch had been together for 10 years. It's a small private school, so we were all pretty tight-knit. However, his mom believed he was the perfect little angel who would outshine everyone else. In reality, he only got those since his mom would bribe their way through the system to let the kid have the benefits. Such as instead of trying out, the mom would pay their way into sports teams so he'd get credit, only for him to be benched the entire game. The worst part was that as years went by, and to this day honestly, the kid bought into his mom's narrative and believed he was superior to many of us with the mom making many outlandish claims. Among these tactics was something I'd noticed for a while. See, in the Philippines, instead of dividing the academic year in semesters, we had quarters, and within each quarter, we had two major long tests. Henceforth, I'll be referring to as LTs. Then, after each quarter, we had a quarterly exam. Henceforth, I'll be referring to as QEs. As each quarter progresses, the QEs would aggregate lessons from the quarters that had passed along with that quarter's lessons. Anyway, for some time now, our class had noticed that the kid would call sick on the day of the major exams and then the mom would call on the kids in the higher bracket grading who were supposedly close with the kid to ask for the exact content of the tests so that they could study it for the retest. Now, I'm not exactly a star student, okay, not at all, but my grades were decent enough for her to consider me within that call list. I mean, I hung out with the guy and he was nice enough until his mom began inflating his ego. So during the third QE for algebra, surprise, surprise, the kid calls in sick. Now this was pretty expected since everyone had already been betting on it. Sure enough, by evening, the mom calls up asking exactly what was on the test, each question and answer. I tell her off and she starts spouting on about, grades are important, and I'm just caring for the future of my child, and he deserves to be in the honor society, and you should be more charitable. Uh, okay, whatever lady. By this point, I'd had enough, so I comply, but with a twist. I end up giving her all the items of our second QE. Without a thought, she begins typing it down. I can hear her frantic fingers on the keyboard through the phone and begins taking down each and every word I say. Here's the kicker. Our algebra teacher did not even include lessons from the past QEs. She thanks me profusely and how I'm such a saint and a savior to her son. Ugh, quit the sweet talk, lady. Anyway, kid comes in, takes the test, and oh look, he got an F. To add insult to injury, our teacher was the one who'd put in the numerical percentage so we had a clear idea on how we did. Kid got a 35%. The mom confronts me and says, You lied. What you told me wasn't on the test. I played the ignorance card and said, Hmm, maybe he switched it up. They never bothered me again. He dropped from the honor society that year. People caught wind of the story and started doing the same thing. Parents, never spoon feed your kids. 
it never works out well. We are in college now, and all updates on the kid's college life are non-existent. We don't even know if he's in college. Every time we have a reunion, he's evasive on the topic, despite everyone openly talking about their ups and downs on uni life. Last we heard, the mom was claiming her little Einstein was taking a double degree. We have a classmate whose uncle is a professor in the said degree, and he said he's never heard of the kid there. Entitled Parent Yells at Me For Being Good At Laser Tag Cast We've got me, we've got annoying kid, we've got entitled mom, we've got staff, and friend. Background I was invited to friend's birthday, and it was at a place with a laser tag arena, and I'm pretty good at it. I arrived quite early to the birthday, so I soon guaranteed my place in the line. It was the right move, because there was a line to enter it, and to make the line move faster, the rules were free for all, with about 10 people in the arena each time, and when you lost, you exit the arena and give your equipment to the next kid in the line. Once I was inside, I defeated some enemies and was still with all my lives. Everything was okay, until I defeated annoying kid. He was younger than me, and I had defeated him before. So he went through the entire line again before I defeated him the second time. Annoying kid after recognizing me. Hey, how are you here if I entered the line before you? Me. I simply didn't lose my lives. That's not possible. You're cheating. Me. Go and lie to someone else while running to get another enemy. So while I was running near the arena entrance, the door opened and the staff called me. So I exited the arena and went to see what he wanted. Staff. It's him? Annoying kid. Yes, it is, entitled mom, before I even realize what's happening. So, you're the one that's cheating and defeating my angel. Me, I'm not cheating. My son said that you are cheating, so yes, you're cheating. And I'm sure that if staff looks at your gear, he will see that you're cheating. Staff, let me check your gear. I give him the gear so he can check it. Staff tells entitled mom, nothing is wrong with his gear. Staff to me, you can go back in the arena. But he's been in the arena for more than 20 minutes, and my angel stayed less than 5 minutes each time. But ma'am, the rules are clear. You're only eliminated when you're defeated, and he hasn't lost yet. But this isn't fair. He played more than my son. Ma'am, please calm down. I only work here. I'm not the one who created the rules. At this moment, I decide to return to the arena, where I stayed until annoying kid entered the arena again, and somehow convinced 6 of the other players to come after me. I had defeated some of them before. So seven kids rushed at me, and even though I managed to defeat four of them, including Annoying Kid, they were able to defeat me. At this point, I only had half of my life's remaining. So after that, I returned to the line and managed to return to the arena. But after half of the other players decided to go against me again, I decided to go and do something else. I just remember Entitled Mom and Annoying Kid looking mad at me every time they saw me. If you're wondering, Annoying Kid was only at the party because Entitled Mom was friend with Friend's Mom. Like some of the other kids, he was able to convince to attack me, so I had never met him before. Stop making noise after 10pm? Alrighty then. Some time ago, four years and change to be precise, my best friend and I moved into a nice house with a cool inner garden and a tiny living room looking out into it. We, 20 at the time, weren't really into partying. But as most university students still had some friends who would come over two to three times a month in twos or threes to hang out, bake, drink some wine and chill. Nice times. Once the weather got warm enough, we would sit in the garden and talk. And here, you'll just have to take my word that we were only talking once the clock hit 2200, as that's when the official night hours start around here. So no shouting, not even the quietest of music, no more than four people having a chill conversation in their own backyard. Working and studying, mind you, doesn't leave much time for such luxuries, so again, that's no more than twice a month. Across the fence, there lived a just-no family. An older lady and her husband in one house, and her daughter, toddler, grandkids, and two small obnoxious dogs barking all day, every day, and the next, both sharing a garden bordering on ours. Two meter high concrete wall between us and them. Additionally, we had never met them in person, until they started showing up at 2205, demanding that we go inside and close all windows so as to not be heard at all. Because otherwise, we are a great awful inconvenience, super loud, and an absolute breach of the rules. Not true, but the constant bickering, threats, and calls to the landlord spoiled any enjoyment of the garden and summer evenings for us. 
The final straw was when the husband appeared at 2202. So he had obviously been waiting to lecture us as to how we can be as loud as we want, but no later than 2200, because in this community, we have rules. Alrighty then, cue malicious compliance. Both of us enjoy a wide variety of musical genres, jazz, blues, swing, classical, folk, the occasional pop or rap track, you name it, and rock and metal abundantly. So for the next two years, every evening with nice enough weather, the time from 2100 to 2200 became the neighborhood musical education hour. And at this point, it ain't jazz either and is as loud as we darn well please. We're having a blast unwinding from the day incorporating all cooking and showering into a dance routine. Then, all music stops at the strike of 2200. Yes, we have an actual church with actual bells that rings even at the time of the night. And on and on, evening after evening, till the leaves start to fall and it gets too cold to blast some nice Ramstein or Pink Floyd or whatever through the huge living room window. They tried to complain to the landlord about it too, but at this point, he told them that they got exactly what they asked for and to buzz off. Only thing we hear from the other side of the fence nowadays is them screeching at their dogs, and they lived happily ever after. Homeless looking guy actually does work in the building. So, years ago, I got a pretty sweet gig working as a security guard, shift supervisor actually, important, a building downtown. It was a mixed use building, so we had a food court, retail stores on two levels, as well as five office towers. When I first started, one of the things all the guards are taught is to treat everybody they deal with respectfully. The building did have a lot of transients and homeless people wander through, but we prided ourselves on being courteous and polite to everyone. Well, one lazy Sunday morning, I get a frantic call from our building operator, guy who watches all the security cameras telling me I need to get to a specific bank of chairs on the second floor. He's panicking and I can't make out much of what he's saying other than one of my guard's names. I go rushing over, worried about this guard who's a bit of a loudmouth bully and he might be in a fight or something. Oh boy, do I wish that was the case. When I get there, the guard is berating an older gentleman who is seated in one of the chairs. Guy has a pile of paper and a coffee on the table in front of him and is pretty shabbily dressed. A pair of threadbare jeans, dirty running shoes, a faded and stretched out t-shirt, and a leather jacket that has more scuffs than leather at this point. There's a ratty laptop bag on the floor leaning against the table. The guard is darn near purple in the face, screaming at this guy to get out, pointing wildly and yelling about how we don't allow pieces of garbage to live here. You've been here an hour. Move along. I walk up, tell the guard to cool his heels. Hey guard, let's all just take a breath. What's going on here? And then I greet gentleman in the chair and ask what seems to be the problem. The second gentleman gets two words out. Guard lights up on a tangent about how this homeless dude is loitering and needs to leave but won't get up. I shush him and try talking to the gentleman again and this time he got out four words before the guard interrupts again and this time starts threatening to literally flip the chair forward to toss the gentleman onto the floor. I finally have enough with the guard and tell him to go to the office and cool off and that I will deal with the gentleman. Guard begrudgingly leaves, and I apologize to the gentleman about the guard's overreaction. Gentleman basically says, I appreciate it. I work in X Tower on X floor and forgot my keys. I was waiting till my assistant arrives and can let me in. I automatically offer to let gentleman into his office. We do all the time and have specific protocols for it, and he accepts. So away we go to the elevator. We reach the floor and then doors open, which is when I realize where I am. Every single night, we patrol every single office space of every single tower except for one. On one floor, the entire space is occupied by a legal firm that is worth multi-millions and we aren't allowed in the office, ever. Yup, I'm standing on that floor. Gentleman steps into the floor lobby and I have to excuse myself to go and get the key for his office. We aren't allowed to carry a copy of it, so I can let him in and he just nods. I race down to the building operations room, snag the key, and race back as fast as I can. When I get back to the floor, I open the office door and gentleman invites me in as he goes to shut off the alarm. I then have to awkwardly ask him for his ID and to see his office so I can verify that he's allowed to be there. He chuckles and obliges me. He's the owner of the legal firm. Thanks me for letting him in and I leave. 
About 20 minutes later, the president of our security company arrives on site with two other people and guard who blew a gasket is escorted off site. Fired. As soon as I left lawyer, he called the manager of the building at home to have words and manager then called security company who came down personally. I got a nice compliment for how I handled things and I learned why we had the rule of treating everybody with respect. You don't want me in your class? Okay. Okay, so this took place a long time ago. I think it was in 2009. I was 14 years old and for context, we live in a country that's not very familiar with English, especially in 2009. At this period, almost nobody used English in their daily life. No song translations and all the media was in our native language. This resulted in really poor English lessons. We were learning since we were 11 years old and we were studying simple stuff. For my part, I was always interested in languages and I was traveling for sport as I was training better and started to do international kayak competitions. This resulted in me not only learning but using English for three years. At that point, I already read two Harry Potter books in English, so I can say I was really bored in English class. I had little time to do my homework because I was training a lot. And boy, we had a lot of homework. I was studying science, math, English, German. None of them were being my native language. And art. And this resulted in a lot of stuff to do after class. So when the year started, I especially chose a place at the back of the classroom for the English lessons. Usually, in English, the teacher gives an exercise, waits for everybody to finish it, then asks the student to resolve the beginning of the exercise. If he does not know, she goes to ask the next student, etc., until all of the exercise is solved. This permitted me to resolve the exercise in 5 minutes and do my homework during 15 minutes while listening to the answers or correcting in 5 minutes with all the correct answers written on the blackboard. Not to brag, but to me, it was really easy, and I was not correcting a lot of my first answers. And you may ask, how did I do when she asked me to answer? Well, my answers were ready, so it was easy. I had been doing this for years with several English teachers, and as I was not disturbing the class, none of them were annoyed by that. But her, she did not like it. So the first time she noticed was in the middle of the year. I was stuck on a math problem and I had not followed how far she was in the exercise and what she asked for. So of course, I asked her to repeat the question. I think that's the first time she has looked at my desk. Her face was priceless. I had two different exercise sheets, three mathematical formula sheets, a pile of draft sheets filled with calculation, a lot of colored pens, a ruler and a calculator, while her exercise were on a single sheet and I should have an English book open to help me do the exercise. Her. Where is your English book? Me. Oh, I have it. It's in my bag. Why don't you have it in front of you? I don't need it. Obviously you do, as you cannot answer my question. But, and what are you doing anyway? Put all that useless stuff in your bag and open your English book. So, being non-confrontational, I obliged for the rest of the lesson. It was boring. The next lesson I really needed to do my homework and I did not want to lose that much time as I did during the last exam. So as always, I started silently. I decided to do small homework, the type that only needs one sheet of paper so she would not notice. But she did and she got mad. She asked me once again to put that use this stuff away. So I decided to do exactly what she asked. I put her English book and sheet in my bag. She shouted at me and sent me to the headmaster with an explanation note. The headmaster is the one supposed to punish you in our schools, for example, by giving detention. But just before I closed the classroom door, she made one last mistake. She shouted, And if my lesson does not please you, you are not forced to come to my class. Well, before that point, I was. I went to the headmaster. He asked a couple of questions and, as he knew my training situation, he did not give me detention. He just asked me to apologize to the teacher. And here finally comes the malicious compliance. I wrote a small letter stating, I am sorry I implied that the English book is useless. It is a well-written reference book that may be useful to 12-year-old students. Petty but relieving. Before the next English lesson, I put the letter on my desk and left before she arrived. I went to a room where students without a teacher can study calmly under the supervision of a school employee. Therefore, I was not doing anything against the rules of the school. If I was not under the supervision of a teacher, I had to be there. And this was the perfect place to do my homework. Of course, after 15 minutes, I get disturbed by a student from my class who states that she asks me to come back to class. I answered I was busy and she gave me the right not to come to class. That everyone heard her and if she wants to revoke that, she can see to this with my head teacher or with the headmaster. 
The student left and the end of the hour was quiet. A few days passed and of course, I am asked to go to the headmaster's office and she's there. My head teacher is there, the headmaster is there and to my surprise, my mother is there. My mom is also a teacher in this school, PE teacher and she heard what happened and did not want to miss it. Headmaster, OP, please have a seat. Me, is it going to be long? We have a German lesson that I don't want to miss. English teacher, see, OP is always like that. Headmaster, don't worry OP, you are excused for missing your lessons. Head teacher, so can you explain to us why you don't go to English class anymore? Me, well, I don't learn anything there and I have homework to do, as you may know. My head teacher was the science teacher. She gave a lot of homework. English teacher, you could do it at home like everyone else. That's why it's called homework. Mom, she is training two to four hours per day and I can assure you she is also doing homework at home. Headmaster, do you really need this extra time to do your homework? Me, yes, four hours per week, it is a lot. Head teacher, I don't understand why you did not have this problem before. Me, because I was already doing them during the English lesson. English teacher just never noticed because I was not disturbing the class. Headmaster, I see. English teacher, there is no way she is doing her homework in my classroom. This classroom is for English only. Me, I'll do them in the study room then. You allowed me not to come to your class. I don't see why there is a problem. Mom smiling, indeed, I don't see the problem. English teacher, but the exam. Oh, don't worry about your exam. I will still succeed. Mom, but we will be asking for an external jury if English teacher is acting like this. This is something we can do in my country if we have suspicion of non-correct teachers. Headmaster, well, as I see it, not going to the English class is not helping you to succeed in the English exam. So this would be your choice and your risk. If you make this choice, you may not come back on your decision and complain if you fail. Me, I know. Headmaster, I will see with the secretary if we can make some kind of official paper for this. Maybe we'll be happy to have her parents' signature as well, mom. Mom, trusting me, with pleasure. Headmaster, head teacher, would you agree to this decision as you know OP better than me? Head teacher, I don't know how she does in English, but she is working hard in science and I think we can trust her decision making it for herself. I would be disappointed to see her homework not be turned in on time and it is her English exam after all. English teacher, but headmaster, and I don't think you will need an external jury as I will reread OP's English exam myself after correction. You agree, English teacher? <clears throat> I guess so. Headmaster, then it's settled. Have a nice day. That's his way of asking us to leave. And like that, the end of the year went smoothly. I had more time to do my homework and I succeeded her exam. Entitled ants want to decide who I marry. OP stands up for himself for the first time. Cast, we've got OP. We've got Entitled Ant 1, wife of my mom's oldest brother. We've got Entitled Ant 2, wife of my mom's older brother. We've got Cousin 1, Entitled Ant 1's married daughter, my oldest cousin. We've got my mother, who was too sweet to say anything against anyone to their face. So a while back, I decided to introduce my girlfriend to my family and start having a mature discussion about me wanting to marry her and seeking their blessing. The challenge was that she was from a different religion. This was during a long weekend associated with a festival and my extended family had gathered around at my grandmother's place. Things were going well and I just pulled in the wedding of my older cousin into the discussion and soon the conversation came to where I wanted it to come to. My wedding. Hooray! Boy, I was wrong. I wasn't being asked for an opinion there. Entitled Aunt One. When it comes to OP's wedding, I think we should all have a say as to who does he marry. Same woman who informed about her daughter's, my first cousin, wedding just a week before that happened but wants full control of my wedding. How cute. Entitled Aunt 2. Yes, he is the only boy in our side. All my cousins on my mom's side are girls, and we have to be 100% involved in his wedding. So, it is only fair we get to decide the girl. The place is India, and arranged marriage is still lurking around here. Help. I just peeped at my sister, and she gave me a sympathetic nod as if to let me know that she understands how horribly all of this is turning out for me. In a while, on the table were names of girls they knew that would be a good fit for me and more garbage, so I decided to man up. Me. Actually, I have a girlfriend. I showed them pictures of her, and then when they got to know that she's from a different religion, they lost their crap. My parents were calm, 
upset at me for doing this without discussing it with them first, but calm. So that was a huge relief. My uncles were calm too. They were asking logical questions like, when do I plan to proceed? Do I have enough savings for a wedding and more stuff? But not my aunts. They were wailing and whining about how I was going to ruin the family reputation and how I am ruining the name of my parents. How my aunts would have to be ashamed in front of all their family and the rest of the world because I decided to pick my partner. I have always been the nice kid in the family, had zero rebel traits, was always soft-spoken, so telling them about my girlfriend itself was a big move on my part. The next argument from Entitled Aunt 1 was how my mother has raised me wrong and that it is what has triggered the whole love in me. Entitled Aunt 2 He is going to set a bad example for the rest of the kids around here. Entitled Aunt 1 Yes, look at your cousin. She never fell in love with any man and quietly married the boy we chose for her. She's so happy. Cousin 1 is in a horrible marriage with zero guts to divorce. She never had any guts to stand up for herself and I'm guessing you can figure out why. My mom cried a bit, and that is when I realized that, one, what the heck was I thinking? Two, I need to step up or have all my cousins give up on their dreams because their brother could not stand up for himself. Me, entitled dance one and two, you guys practically raised me when I was very young. I know you love me a lot. Entitled aunt one, now calming down a bit. Yes, we do. Me, I am 25 now. I would be marrying in another two years and I would probably live to see 65. So how much is that? 40 more years and 38 years of marriage? I hardly get to see you these days. How many days do we see each other? Five days a year? Let's consider one week. So in the next 40 years of my life, you'd be seeing me for 40 weeks. And you might get to see my partner even less than that. Let's say 20 weeks. That is just five months or less. Can't my loving aunts pretend to like my wife for 140 days for me? And all of this, assuming that you'll be alive to see me turn 60. It would break my heart if you died before I did. The dinner was a very silent affair that day. Would you marry someone that your relatives didn't approve of? Please let me know. Me and Karen, a love story. Just kidding, Karen is a total jerk. But buckle up, because here is my novel. My husband and I are in our late 30s and child-free. Some people on child-free said I should post here too, so enjoy the saga. My husband and I had been saving up for almost a decade to move to a tropical paradise. About two years ago, we bit the bullet and moved to our dream location. Housing here is super expensive, like Hawaii prices, so all we could afford was half of a duplex. It is beautiful and on the water with places for our boat. Unfortunately, Karen, Billy Bob, the boyfriend, and her three gremlins live in the other unit. Set up. There is some period of time we just went for a week here and there, but we live here full time now. The entire duplex was owned by an older gentleman who rented out both sides. The sides do not match at all. One side is a five bedroom, three bath. The other side of the duplex is a two bedroom, one bath. We bought the five bedroom. On our side of the property, we have 90% of the backyard, a gazebo, and dockage, about 150 feet since it's on a corner. The other side has a small backyard, patio, and maybe 15 feet of dockage. The rental leases say the renters are entitled to their specific backyards, but there were no fences or anything, so all the renters shared the entire backyard. After we bought the house, Karen immediately tried to throw her weight around that they expected to continue with that privilege. I told her if she asked politely, we would try to accommodate her. She thought this meant she could use our backyard whenever she wanted. Party incident. One day, my husband and I are enjoying some drinks outside when a delivery truck shows up to set up a giant blow up thing in our backyard. I asked Karen what she thought she was doing and she said it was for her kid's birthday. Then she had the gall to say it was a family and friends only event so we had to stay inside our house. Not wanting to be a total jerk and ruin some little kid's birthday, I told Karen after this she had no access to our backyard, period. Karen shrugged and kept setting up for the party. During the party, a drunk idiot wandered into our house which shocked us all. I said Karen's house is the other side and he said, Oh, Karen said she owned the whole property and to use whichever bathroom was available. I directed him to Karen's bathroom and soon after she came storming into our house, screaming about how dare we make her look bad to her friends 
and how selfish we are we couldn't even spare one bathroom. She said we didn't deserve all this space with just us. I told Karen to get the heck out of my house or I would be calling the cops. She finally left and the party wrapped up shortly after. Backyard Remodel After the party incident, we decided we needed to clearly define the backyard and build a fence. While we were spending the money, we decided to update the patio, put in a fire pit, and an outdoor kitchen. While the contractor was on site, nosy Karen had to come investigate. Since the fence would be the last thing built, I was vague and just stuck to telling her about the patio update. You could see her face light up because of course in her mind, what's ours is hers. When the workers started on the fence, Karen came out screaming for the work to stop. I went outside and told the workers to keep working and told Karen to butt out. Of course, in true Karen fashion, she called the cops. What happened next was hilarity on my part after explaining to the cop that we were building a fence on our property and the landlord, of which Karen was not, knew about it. When the cop gave Karen a stern lecture, I thought her head was going to explode. She went back into her house and slammed the sliding door so hard it sounded like something cracked. We got our fence and I thought that would be the end, but of course not. The boat incident. One day, Billy Bob entered the picture and he was as much of a terrible neighbor as Karen was. He would throw cigarette butts and empty beer cans over our fence for disrespecting his woman. I didn't know Paradise had these kinds of folks, but Billy Bob really took the cake. Billy Bob has a boat, a 30-foot fishing boat to be precise. Of course, that side of the duplex only has 15 feet of dockage. Since we have so much dockage and only one boat, we rent out the other dockage spot as a month to month. People come and go, so if we don't receive rent from them by the end of the month and the boat disappears, we think nothing of it. We had a renter who tied up their boat on the property line, but Billy Bob wanted to park his boat and needed that space. Karen and Billy Bob posed as us. We were out of town, told the renters to be gone at the end of the month, and then parked Billy Bob's boat on the dockage. I only found out about it weeks later because the renter left a nasty review on the rental site we use. They said we were rude and went back on the verbal agreement to let them stay for three more months. I was like, what the heck is all this? After a phone call, I quickly put two and two together. I called the cops who told Karen and Billy Bob they need to move their boat or it would be towed, the equivalent of it anyway. Karen and Billy Bob started screaming the boat is fully on their property. It isn't. Then changed to no one can own the water. True, but a seawall is deeded. That we are liars and at some point Billy Bob punched a cop and went to jail. I felt bad for the cops so took them all snacks the next day with a note apologizing for neighbor drama. I ended up winning my small claim suit against them for lost rental income, but of course haven't seen a dime. I eventually convinced the dockage renters to come back and gave them a few months free as compensation. Final Revenge If you've made it this far, congratulations. Get ready for the juicy justice part. So with the collapsing market, we were trying to figure out what to do with our savings when a perfect opportunity opened up. The landlord, who owned both properties, was in desperate need of some cash and was tired of managing the property from 2,000 miles away because, of course, Karen is a Karen and calls him weekly for every little thing. His only stipulation was we let the poor single mom who has been his renter for eight years finish her lease, which is up in July. Since we just have money, we were trying to reinvest and because now we get to control our neighbors, heck yeah, we jumped on that. Since we didn't need a realtor or mortgage and an inspection had been done just a week ago for the old landlord's refinance, everything closed in just under two weeks. Karen was unaware of a change of ownership. We registered the property under an LLC, but didn't know who until eight days ago. I went over to Karen's house and knocked on the door. Karen answered with a, what the heck do you want, jerk? I smiled, handed her our landlord information and sweetly reminded her rent was due by Friday, but she could just hand me the check if that was easier. I've always heard descriptions of people's faces turning white, but this was the first time I have actually seen it. I told Karen that we are honoring her lease until the end of July, but afterwards she had better make plans to move because we intend to remodel it before these next tenants moved in. Bye Karen. Don't touch my horse. He bites. I own a beautiful horse. Chip. He's a brown and white palomino with a half gone fuzzy winter coat. Yeah, he looks like a rat right now. 
clumps of fur everywhere. He has these amazing blue eyes, and I'm so happy to have a horse with blue eyes, as they make him show emotions so much more clearly than our other two horses, KC and Buddy, both having brown eyes. He has a long mane and tail with a very heavy bang. He's naturally chubby, but puts on extra pounds in the winter. I love him very much, but he is such a brat. He nips and bites, and no matter what I do, he won't stop. We refer to him as Sir Sass if we are annoyed with him. He gets lippy if you get near his mouth, and if agitated, he will bite. I never let anyone touch his mouth. He lives next to a road, so he's used to cars, but loud noises and sudden approaches still scare him. On to the story. This just happened today, a windy but warm day. I've done nothing the past few days due to what's going on. I'm sure many of you are in the same situation. I decide I might as well start getting Chip into shape, and it's such a nice day. Go out, run him in our arena, brush, tack him up, and we're off. I decide to take a trail I frequently use. It's somewhat busy occasionally, but it allows horses and has paved paths. It's a bit muddy in spring, but I don't mind. We get about halfway at a slow trot. He's behaving beautifully, and I'm so proud of him for not acting like a complete jerk. In a good mood, I do not notice Entitled Parent approaching. With a sudden jolt, Chip startles. Entitled Parent has marched up to me and grabbed him by the bridle. Do not do this. I reach out, yanking her hand off. What are you doing? I demand, glaring at her. I back Chip up a few paces, putting space between us. She stares at me. Horses aren't allowed on these trails, you jerk. Are you trying to get someone hurt? This is clearly a sick and diseased animal, she shouts, drawing attention. She advances, preparing to grab Chip again. I back him up. Stay away, he's nippy. I warn, patting him. Lo and behold, she ignores me and continues lunging, trying to grab him. I'm starting to panic. Finally, I dismount and holding his reins, face her. He's not sick, he's shedding his winter coat. If you knew anything about horses, you would know this. I, in fact, own a horse. He never grows a coat and sheds it, she states, as if trying to prove me wrong. We are up north. All horses grow winter coats here, lady. In fact, it's likely her horse is probably not growing a coat because it's sick. God knows. She suddenly lunges, taking me by surprise. She snags the reins out of my hand. Chip lets out a neigh and instinctively, sure enough, bites her right on the hand. She screams, letting go. I quickly pick up the reins before he can bolt and awkwardly get on him, patting him and trying to stop him. He's having a horse panic attack, making small bucks and rears. Meanwhile, Entitled Parent is screaming, calling my horse rabid, me irresponsible for not watching my horse. People who are watching earlier are staring in horror. Her hand is bleeding everywhere. Finally, I get control of Chip. She starts screaming, firing insults at me, said I let my horse bite her. My fault that my horse is rabid. Someone calls the police. They show up with an ambulance and she's taken to the ER. Spent the entire afternoon having to explain that no, my horse does not have rabies. No, it was not my fault. And no, I did nothing to her. Police understand that he's just shedding. Witnesses are asked and confirm my claims. So basically, she said this. I was riding on a trail where horses are not allowed. Horse bit her for no reason. He has rabies, a skin disease, and I insulted her and made Chip bite her. Thank God for the witnesses. Her hand is fine, so far as I know. Don't think I'll be riding Chip on that trail anytime soon. Turns out the lady didn't even own a horse, so I guess her imaginary horse doesn't shed in spring. How interesting. Boss tried to be slick changing my employment, ended up having to pay me more than what he thought. To give some background for the story, I was working as a legal assistant at a small law firm but started off as the receptionist. This was a job I could get straight out of college while I give myself some time to adjust to adulting life and getting ready to apply to graduate slash law school. He fired a coworker over her asking for a higher raise and immediately told me I was going to take over. The law firm has eight employees and has a high turnover rate and I didn't realize until a couple of months ago. My boss is a stereotypical boomer and gloats about how he was in the army, how he's a ladies man, even though his wife is literally our office manager and doesn't train his employees, even though he forces his employees to sign a contract saying they will have to pay $2,500 if they don't complete one year. Over the past months, he has tried to say my work is terrible, 
even though I used all of his templates and had to correct him with information I received from the court on how to do these exact family pleadings and I have closed cases that have been with us for years in the span of one to three months. Blames me for being rude to clients, even though the clients told him it was not me and was another coworker who he showed favoritism to and consistently asked me if I found the right man. Would I be with that man after he met my girlfriend at the firm's annual holiday party? There's a lot more, but too much to write. Overall, he hated anything about me, and my coworkers would often have to vouch for me because he would take out his anger on me. Because of this, I made sure to always send emails of our conversations and clarify things in order to keep track of all the shortcomings and issues. I even had a meeting with my officer manager and documented the fact that I wasn't trained by sending a follow-up email and screenshotting an email where they made me train a new person one week after I started. Someone please tell me if this looks like adequate training. Three weeks ago, he changed my contract to being a non-essential employee and told my coworker before she quit that he lessened my hours because of my poor work and anything I did could be sent by mail or email. He often rushes through his work and leaves a lot of loopholes in his contract, so cue the malicious compliance. The contract said that I would be a non-essential employee, and by the way he wrote it, he capped phone calls at 0.5 of an hour, but I would get paid $15 per call, $45 for each family packet I did, and $15 per email correspondence. So I did a couple of family pleading packets, but kept my coworkers in the loop, and they told my boss that they were busy with other things and asked if I could make the calls. They knew I am the only one in my household working and felt the contract was terrible. I also asked them how they would read the contract and they interpreted it in the same way I had. Since I was deemed non-essential and he could not be bothered to draft a letter letting me go into the office, I had to send various emails for him to print. When he would ask for me to place items on his desk, I referenced my contract stating I was a non-essential employee and could risk a fine slash jail time. I ended up making so many calls, always tried to make them as long as possible by asking clients how are they and hearing them complain about what's going on and how difficult it will be for them to make payments at this time. That when I sent my hours to my office manager, she CC'd my boss and asked to verify hours and explain. I explained and broke it down with my contract. My boss couldn't be bothered to go back to his email and asked me to forward the contract. At that point, it took them forever to respond and I was eagerly awaiting their response. He attempts to spin it back and change the wording of my contract to say each call was only 75 cents and each correspondence was only $1.50. This would essentially make my paycheck only less than $100 even though I had originally been paid $15 an hour and had worked 50 plus hours in the past two weeks. At that point, I send my resignation and screenshots of all the times I asked how do they want the timesheets sent along with the governor's stay-at-home order for non-essential employees. He attempted to change the story to say that I was an essential employee and finally offered to give me a letter, but at that point, I had already sent my resignation. After reading my email referencing the contract, lack of training, and mentioning the conversation with his wife, he conceded, made an agreement that I was leaving on good terms and is giving me the wages I deserve. Moral of the story, document everything and follow up. I have a second round interview, so please wish me luck. It's a hard time, but we'll get through it. Get your own dang spoon. So I used to work in a really big whiskey bar in my town that also catered for dinner and coffee slash cake sort of things. I had worked there for a couple years, so I guess I was recognizable to a few people and maybe some that hadn't realized I had moved on. I was really good friends with all the staff in there, so I used to come in for a pint and a chat occasionally. The uniform in the whiskey bar is black shirt slash tee and black bottoms, and being a bar person I happen to wear an awful lot of black on a daily basis even in my newer job, which is casual dress. So this one evening, I call in for a drink, and I'm sitting at the bar, waiting for the bartender to finish serving this woman next to me. After about 10 seconds, I realize she's absolutely going out of her way to make life a living heck for the server. She's trying to pay for a bunch of stuff separately, but wants specific changes for each thing, for reasons unknown. And while the guy serving her is doing everything to accommodate her, she creates a new problem with every interaction. Complains that there's too much coins slash not enough coins, the cream on the coffee doesn't look nice enough, etc. And gets quite rude and aggressive, sending her server running back and forth, a bit bizarre. The bartender is a chill guy and does his best to meet her requirements and offers the two Irish coffees she just ordered on the house 
by way of apology for not understanding her. She mutters something under her breath along the lines of, Yeah, dang right, while outwardly expressing her impatience by huffing and tapping her phone loudly on the counter. The bartender serves the drinks and smiles, apologizing again. I'm sitting at the end of the bar near where the sugars, spoons, and milk for coffee is in my black ensemble. The woman turns to me and just says, Spoon, without looking at me. Excuse me? I reply, taken a bit back. Give me a dang spoon, she says, right in my face. I looked her dead in the eye and I responded, I don't work here. I ordered my beer and she went a marvelous shade of red and scuffled off back into whichever pit she had ascended from. She never got her dang spoon. Be roommates with my son and give him your games and food. Update part two. Hey people of Reddit, my cousins gave me a second update about a couple of days ago about entitled mom and kid that have been harassing them this semester. Now, they told me this happened about eight days after the New York trip. So my cousins told me that they do first year student elections during January to February. Entitled kid threw a tantrum when he lost the election for class president and his entitled mom howled at my cousin. Meet everybody. We've got my older cousin, my little cousin, we've got the roommate, entitled mom, entitled kid, entitled kid's roommate, student body vice president, the nice kid, entitled kid's nice dad, and the dean. So the setting. My cousin and his roommate were having a council meeting discussing the first year elections. Now I was told that the meetings are for student council members and prospects only. Because nice kid was going to be a candidate for president, he was allowed in. And his dad is a janitor and he works a campus job so he doesn't live on campus. The door opens. Cue entitled kid. Oi everyone. My cousin didn't want to deal with his BS and told him to leave. He asked why he couldn't stay and he stated that the meeting was for the student officers and prospects only. Then entitled kid asks, What's a prospect? Older cousin. A prospect is someone who plans to run for office. They are then included in the meeting because they are an associate member. Then entitled kid asked why nice kid was allowed in. Then older cousin stated, Nice kid is a prospect. That's why. Entitled kid then said, I'm gonna be a prospect. Now my cousin knew that if you're on disciplinary probation, which he was, it's impossible for someone to get an appeal. The last time an appeal was successful was 1996, and the last time someone tried was 2009. With that in mind, older cousin laughed in his head and wished him luck, knowing that it would never get approved. Then his mom called the student council office to try to get information about an appeal. Now, my cousin said that the peer council is in charge of appeals. It is comprised of 12 student officers, 3 10th years, 3 11th years, and 3 12th years. The student body vice president vote counts twice. Now, his mom was there in the parking lot during the day of the vote. The vote was 6 out of 5, so entitled kid's appeal was approved. Older cousin had this, why, look on his face, and he saw entitled mom was in the parking lot and her boy came and hugged her. She then said, I told you that mommy would take care of it. She then saw older cousin walked up to him and said, My son got his appeal approved. You have to share that room and be his friend. Entitled kid. Yeah. Older cousin sat there blank for a moment as he realized that he now has to spend time with entitled kid because he has a prospect. Then entitled mom says, Excuse me, didn't you hear what I said? You're going to spend time with my son now. Older cousin then leans towards the mom and told the mom in an eerie way, let it begin. But in truth, older cousin was scared. He realized that if nice kid lost, he would be stuck with entitled kid for the rest of the year. The election was on February 25th, so he had four days to get a game plan. He asked nice kid and the rest of the gang to meet at the room to figure out what to do. It went like this, older cousin, Okay guys, we need to figure something out. If Entitled Kid wins, we're going to be stuck with him for the rest of the year. Nice kid, I have a good feeling I can win. Roommate, that's not the point. Older cousin, yeah, I can imagine that his mom is going to bribe other students to try and get them to vote for her son. Little cousin, we don't have a lot of money, that's the point. Older cousin, so we have very limited cash resources to make you look good. Nice kid, oh, I see. Then Entitled Kid's roommate called his dad and told him what was going on. He stated that his roommate could be class president if he doesn't help them. 
Entitled Kid's roommate's dad agrees to help. So getting Nice Kid exposure was the only thing that was left. The gang worked tirelessly to promote Nice Kid's campaign, even had a town hall with free pizza. Older Cousin said that Entitled Kid really wasn't campaigning. Older Cousin was thinking that maybe he just thought that he was going to win so he didn't put in any effort. The eve of the election, Older Cousin had a meeting with the prospects in his room and told them that their parents have been called and they will be at the announcement when the results are in. Older Cousin then proceeded to talk to Nice Kid and Entitled Kid about student government. Nice Kid was being cool, but Entitled Kid was demanding to eat sweets and to play games. It went like this. Entitled Kid Come on, let me have a honey bun and turn on the PS4. Older Cousin That's not what this meeting is about. It's to prepare you for what is going to happen tomorrow. OMG, turn it on, now. Roommate, he said no. Entitled Kid. Forget you, jerk. I'm gonna be your roommate soon when I become president. You're gonna have to share eventually, so stop holding out. Everybody just sighs loudly to where it's obvious. Then Entitled Kid says, What? It was time to end things, so older cousin dismissed Entitled Kid and Nice Kid. Nice Kid left, and at that time, Entitled Kid's roommate was coming over. Entitled Kid's roommate. Hey, we're still on for tonight, right little cousin? Little cousin. Yeah, I'll pull out the couch. Then Entitled Kid asks, Can I sleep over too? Roommate. No! Entitled Kid pouts. Why not? Roommate. Because you don't live here and you aren't our guest. Well, I'm gonna stay anyway. Entitled Kid then proceeds to sit on the couch and the gang asks him to move, but he doesn't. The gang isn't having it, especially Little Cousin. Little Cousin stands over him and Entitled Kid says, What the heck do you want? Little Cousin, We can either do this the easy way or we can do it my way. Entitled Kid, Shut up, you ain't gonna do nothing. The gang then drags him out and he banged on the door for an hour begging to be let in. Fast forward to tomorrow. The parents, students, and faculty are all there. Vice was getting ready to read the results. Vice, Everybody, thank you for coming. This is a time where we greet the new class officers, our first year students. Everyone, please be quiet and we will be starting at this time. Vice then proceeds to say the candidate's name and how many votes they received. For Entitled Kid, 85 votes. Because student elections aren't that important to first year, 85 was a lot of votes. Then parents started to chat. Entitled Mom and Son were looking smug, looking like they had won. Older cousin admitted to having this, oh crap, look. Then Vice banged his gavel and said, order. For Nice Kid, 764 votes. Nice Kid wins. Little cousin and Entitled Kid's roommate turned to Entitled Mom and Son and pointed in their face and said, booyah. Nice Kid's parents were there and congratulated him and so did the rest of the gang. Entitled Mom and Son were really upset, but my cousin said that Entitled Kid's dad was just there and he was really polite. Entitled mom and son pulled her husband away from the crowd and she demands he do something. Entitled mom, you pay this school a lot of tuition. Our boy has to be president. Entitled kid's nice dad. Well, over 700 people decided that they didn't want Entitled kid to be president. I can't do anything. Entitled kid having a tantrum. I'm supposed to be president. Now look what you did. You made him cry. Come on, mommy will buy you an ice cream. She then turned to Older Cousin. You jerk. You plotted against my son, didn't you? Older Cousin. Well, I didn't help him win. You owe my son. You didn't take him on the trip with you, and you've been bullying him all semester. If you don't be his friend, you're gonna get an earful from my husband. Entitled Kid. Yeah, you jerk. Entitled Kid then flips the bird to Older Cousin and leaves with his mom. Older cousin then had a talk with the nice dad and found out that he had sent him to the school hoping that it would break his son's entitlement. Older cousin tells the dad what has been going on all semester, everything. The dad looked shocked. He begins to apologize profusely for his wife and son's behavior. He stated that he thought he was improving and making friends. Older cousin had to dispel that and said that entitled kid is being a grade A jerk and was being very rude and disruptive to everyone. He gave Older Cousin his number and said if Entitled Kid bothers them, just call him and put him on speaker. Nice Kid ended up choosing Entitled Kid's roommate as his vice president. As the days went by, needless to say, Entitled Kid became even worse when Entitled Kid's roommate was in student government. He said, 
You stole the election from me. You have to pay for this. Entitled Kid kept getting worse. Entitled Kid's roommate made a desperate plea and begged the Dean to switch his roommate. The Dean said, I'm really sorry, but I have to. There's nothing left. I've asked other kids if they'll switch, and nobody wants to. Entitled Kid's roommate, Can you do something? Dean, Well, there is one thing. What is it? Well, theoretically, student officers are allowed to live together. Entitled Kid's roommate, I'm not following you. Dean, If you can convince the guys to let you move in with them, I'll allow it. Entitled Kid's roommate later asked the guys if he could move in. My cousins and roommate said he is more than welcome to live in the room with them. So they proceeded to go and get his things, and it went down like this. Older cousin, just put all your things on the bed and we'll get it. Entitled Kid's roommate, alrighty. Entitled Kid then says, um, what are you doing? Roommate, I'm moving in with the guys. What? Roommate, yeah. Cool, well then I'm coming too. The gang gives a very sarcastic, sure you can and proceed to move Entitled Kid's roommate in. Roommate says in a really smug and sarcastic way, Oh wait, you can't move in with us, remember? You lost! Entitled Kid throws a tantrum in the hallway and everyone sees. The gang gets the rest of his roommate's things and finished moving him in. Entitled Kid's roommate has had the best sleep in weeks. Entitled Kid does still wait by my cousin's door and begs for his roommate to move back in and gives a half-butt apology. The gang promptly ignores him and says, This pizza is so good and it's all ours. Wow, look at these graphics. This is such a cool game. Entitled Kid begs to be let in and the gang never does. They have woken up to him sleeping at the front of their door on more than one occasion. Mandatory late night call after you made me hourly? Yes, sir. So, quick background. I work for a big national company, which I will not name because I like being employed. And we have a big software system that the entire company relies on to wrap stuff up and get it ready for the clients. It's that last choke point bottleneck where if it dies, literally all the work the rest of the company does is for naught. I run this system at the grunt work day-to-day -day operational level. This system also typically has upgrades and fixes installed about every two weeks and they always wait until late night on Friday to bring it down and do the install so that it doesn't impact daily business. Now. When these installs occurred, they always got a bunch of people on a call to go through everything and make sure it all works before calling it good for Monday. Being the guy who runs the system all the time, I was always required to be on these calls. I hated them. The calls started at 10 p.m. Friday night, so I couldn't go out and enjoy my weekend. Would last about two hours while the developers installed stuff, and at the very end, I pushed one button to kick things off so the suits could see that it was working and everybody was happy. This was literally monkey work, and everyone on those calls could have done it. I volunteered to teach them how, but no, they wanted me on the call. I was salary at the time, so not exactly like I could say no, and I wasn't getting paid anything extra for it. Can you see where this is going yet? Okay, so a few years ago, guidelines changed at the government level, saying anyone who made X amount per year or less couldn't be defined as salary so they had to be hourly to stop companies from abusing glorified part-time workers. I made more than that, but the company went overboard because I was somewhere in the general ballpark and they didn't want to risk it. So bam, I'm now hourly. Roughly two weeks later, it's deployment call time. I ask if I'm really required to be there or not. Boss man says yes. I don't complain because at least now I get paid for it. Oh, but wait, this isn't any normal deployment. No, this is a big one. They tell me I need to be on the calls that will start up at 5 right as I'd normally be clocking out for the day. Thinking it would be a quick check-in and then back out until 10, I dutifully call in. Nope, this call lasts from 5 until 10 when we got to take all of our 5 minute break and get into the other call. Now I'm home short, so I'm sitting at this call in my underwear and nothing going on requires any input from me at all. Again, I'm not complaining because I'm getting paid for this and I've got Netflix on in the background. Not only am I getting paid, since I did my full 40 that week, already this was overtime. So 10 o'clock deployment stuff starts going on and by midnight we get to my part. I push the button. I tell them it's going to take about 20 to 30 minutes to process before we even know if it worked. Half hour of twiddling thumbs later, it fails. Some cursing from developer as they go to try to fix whatever barked and I got to spend another 30 minutes resetting all the data so we can try again. 
Once everything is ready, I push the button. 30 minutes later, it fails again. Fast forward several hours. It's now 5 o'clock Saturday morning. It still hasn't run properly. Everyone is cranky except me because baby, I got dollar signs in my eyes. 12 hours of overtime for watching Netflix and doing monkey work is gonna be sweet. Except it was even better than I thought at the time. That Saturday was technically some minor holiday. My company pays time and a half if you work on a holiday. So I had 7 hours of overtime and 5 hours of overtime with additional time and a half. I ended up making over half a week's pay overnight from that call. My boss flipped when he saw the check I was supposed to get. I reminded him that I had asked an email what half the team copied if he really needed me on that call, and that he said I absolutely had to be. Unlike some of the bosses I read about on here, he swallowed his defeat gracefully. I got a huge paycheck that period, and oddly enough, I have not been required to attend a single one of those calls since then. Huh, I wonder why. Side note, developer worked on it all weekend and got it running by Monday morning, so we were fine. Entitled mom screams at me over an item I bought, gets kicked out of the store. Some backstory. I have recently been diagnosed with cancer. It's stage one, and I would prefer not to say what type, but just know that I am currently being treated for it, and I am also scheduled for surgery to get it taken out. As any cancer patient will tell you, the chemo sucks. My oncologist told me that I'm not supposed to go out much because she doesn't want me to risk getting sick because my immune system is currently sitting somewhere in the garbage. All very reasonable. However, the pain meds that I am taking are a controlled substance, and as such, I cannot have it be delivered. And I also cannot send someone else to pick it up for me. It must be me, and I am also required to show ID to pick it up. Also important to note is that my boyfriend has been taking massage therapy classes so that he can help me feel better when the pain becomes unbearable. I don't feel like there needs to be a cast mentioned because it was really just me, my boyfriend, Karen, a security guard, and a male cashier involved. And only me, Karen, and the cashier actually spoke. Alrighty, with that out of the way, let's begin. My boyfriend and I had to go out to pick up a prescription for me. The pharmacy, we'll call Hoppers, has groceries, household items, and also the usual stuff you'd find at a pharmacy in it. We decided to pick up some groceries and supplies while we were waiting for the pharmacist to fill said prescription. So I took a cart and headed down an aisle to grab some face cleansing stuff. After I did that, I turned around and headed towards the pharmacy area to check to see how long we had until my meds were ready. On my way there, I grabbed a bottle of aloe vera gel as it was on sale. And just as I do, the following happened. Karen practically screaming at me. Oh, of course. Look at you grabbing the aloe vera gel right away. Oh, I wonder why. I turned around to look at her. She didn't have the typical Karen haircut, but she did have her long blonde hair piled up on top of her head in a messy bun, bright pink nails, and a lot more makeup than a trip to Hoppers called for. She scoffed and smirked at me and then stomped off before I could say anything back at her. I was stunned and I think my brain actually misfired a couple of neurons or something because I just couldn't believe that some random lady just yelled at me over aloe vera gel. After I picked my jaw up off the floor, I looked around for her because I was angry. I mean, what business is it of hers if I'm buying some aloe vera? Like sure, you can use it to make hand sanitizer, but I literally grabbed just one bottle of it, not even close to the four per customer limit that the store had. After a couple of minutes, I spotted her two aisles over, so I quietly came up behind her and… me, not yelling but definitely louder than necessary. Lady, I have cancer. Excuse me for enjoying a massage for my boyfriend every now and then after a grueling day of cancer treatment. Karen turns bright red, stammering. I… I wasn't talking about you, I was talking about someone else. Me. Yeah, whatever lady. The thing is, she and I were the only ones in the store besides my boyfriend and the staff due to the store only allowing so many people in at a time. And also because this particular hoppers is a little smaller than most, so it doesn't seem to get a lot of traffic anyway. I walked away to find my boyfriend so that we could continue shopping while we waited for my meds. I found him and of course told him what just happened. You'd think it was over at this point, but oh no. After a little while had passed, my meds were ready and my boyfriend and I managed to get everything on our shopping list. We were done and I was getting pretty tired, so we headed towards the front to pay for everything. I guess a few more customers had come into the store after all of that happened, so there was a bit of a line. But we really didn't mind because that's when I saw Karen standing directly in front of us in line. I pointed her out to my boyfriend. 
He was still fuming about how she had yelled at me, and also about how she straight up lied to my face when I called her out on it. But then he kind of chuckled, then nudged me, and gestured towards the Karen's shopping cart. This crazy Karen had the entire cart absolutely full of toilet paper. This store has huge signs everywhere about how there's a limit of two packages per customer. And Karen had an entire shopping cart full. Boyfriend and I watched in awe as she pulled out her credit card as she gets closer to the front and we got to witness the most glorious thing unfold right in front of us. Cashier, politely. I'm sorry ma'am, but due to extremely high demand, there's a limit of only two packages per customer. Karen cuts him off. Yeah, I saw, but I don't care about your stupid signs. I'm a paying customer. I have a right to buy whatever the heck I want. Cashier. But the system won't Karen screaming now. I don't care. I am paying for it, so I will have what I want. Insert long, loud rant here. The cashier must have called for security somehow, or maybe they just heard the screeching. But whatever the case, a security guard materialized out of seemingly nowhere. Karen lost her mind and was practically frothing at the mouth when she saw the security guard. She tried to ram him with her cart, but since there was a lot of room, he just sidestepped it grabbed her by the arm, and Frog marched her out of the store. My boyfriend and I were quiet all the way back to the car, but the second we got in and the doors were closed, we looked at each other and cracked up laughing. We laughed so long and so hard that both of us had tears running down our faces. The whole way home, we couldn't even look at each other without starting to laugh again. Customer berates an employee and doesn't realize I'm the manager. About 8 years ago, I was around 21 years old and the manager of a subway. To be fair to this customer, I have always looked younger than I am. This story is about a very berating customer, we can call them BC, and a sweet but mildly meek employee we will call SE. Employee is helping customer through the line and everything seems to be going well. I walked out of the back to help a customer that had walked in midway through interaction. She's doing her best to accommodate his exacting demands. Things like, only four pickles, and two shakes of pepper, etc. They get the checkout, and customer lays into employee. I'm not paying full price, and I want a free drink. Are you stupid? It's not that hard to make a dang sandwich. Employee had done everything right up to this point, to portion, both for his request and to corporate standards when not given an amount. And employee had been extremely polite during this. She gets a deer in the headlights type of look when he begins this shouting and does what I trained her to. Employee offers to remake the sub if it's not correct. See, we've had a problem with people coming in regularly trying to get free food, so instead the sandwich gets thrown out and we will remake it from scratch, which at a busy store like ours, my employees could start to finish a sub in two minutes or less if you knew what you wanted on it or they didn't work rush. This infuriates him more. No, I don't want you to remake it. Are you deaf and dumb, you idiot? As he smugly looks back in my direction, thinking he's going to win this. At this point, I hold up a finger to the regular I'm helping with a gleam in my eye. This customer stifles a chuckle as this isn't the first time she has seen me stand up to a ridiculous customer. Look, my employees are working for barely more than minimum wage at a fast-paced environment. They don't deserve to be treated like crap. There is a difference between a frustrated customer with a legit complaint and one with a berating attitude. I interject. Sir, is there anything I can help you with? Customer. Yeah, this dumb jerk can't do anything right. I want to speak to your manager. Me. Well, sir, you're speaking to him right now. You are not the manager. You're far too young. Is everyone here stupid or me? Done with the situation. I am the manager, sir. And as such, I won't have you talking to my employees that way. I'm exercising my right as a business to refuse you service and you have 30 seconds to vacate my store before I call the police. Customer bulks up at this. You wouldn't dare, you little me. Our front line has both video and audio recording for both the safety of my employees and my customers. I will trespass you and allow my employee to pursue harassment if the police see it fit. I pick up the phone. I have never seen anyone dart out of the store so quickly. My regular nearly kills over laughing. My closer in the back shouts, heck yeah! Employee who is nearly in tears, I like to think out of combination of embarrassment, relief, and joy. Needless to say, I told her she handled that extremely well and to direct any similar customers to me. She also got her lunch, apparently comped that day, by me for putting up with it as long as she did. 
Almost as funny as how a meatball sandwich ended in divorce, but that's another story for another time. Speaking of Subway, what's your favorite sandwich to get there? I'm so hungry right now, and I'd love to hear from you. Karen gets mad for having to respect her free nanny. I started spending time with an old friend from school that had two kids now. She had just left a difficult situation and turned to me for help, as I was her only friend in trade school and since she had left. She stayed at my house for a week before getting into a women's shelter that gave her an apartment until she could get Section 8. No one was allowed to know she was there, and I stood by her this whole process, watching her kids for hours on end, making sure they were fed and looked after. People would tell me I'm such a good person for helping her, and honestly, it made me feel like crap for not being able to help more. But at that time, I was having a hard time mentally and had just lost my job, so I couldn't support her financially. I was allowed to be in her apartment because I was her support for the kids. This is where the entitlement comes in. She had never thanked me or really even asked for my help, rather demanded most of the time I never expected a thank you and was just happy to help. But things took a turn a couple weeks in. She started to be really nasty towards me, making comments on my appearance and pointing out my flaws and insecurities. She even started getting her oldest to as well. They are well-behaved kids for the most part and really are just typical kids. She started dropping her kids on me with no notice and leaving me with them for hours. When I was at her apartment, she would sleep all day and I took care of her kids, keeping them quiet, making them breakfast, lunch, and dinner, keeping them entertained and trying to teach the oldest his letters while making sure the youngest stayed out of trouble. She would roll out of bed and complain about the dishes being dirty then talk to her kids for a minute before playing on her phone until nighttime, then go back to bed. She didn't look for work at all, despite my begging her to so she could either 1. pay me, or 2. find care somewhere else so I could find a job. The first time I snapped was over something small. Her oldest ran up to her wearing a Spider-Man mask my mom had bought for him because he loved Spider-Man. This boy treasured Spider-Man, wanted to be him. His mom's response? Spider-Man is stupid and lame. Only losers like Spider-Man. Now this was significant to me for a couple of reasons. She just crapped on her son's hero and my family loves Spider-Man. He's even my favorite superhero, something which she knows very well. She just did so many weird and awful things. We fought, but I ended up still watching her kids as she promised to look for work. She told me that she will never get a job with her training because it sucked. The same exact training I received by the same teacher. I just waved it off and resigned myself to forever being these kids caretaker. The second time I exploded is when she told me my best friend was just a pathetic moron. My best friend is in prison. Longer story. She was 16. The final straw was actually her oldest son. He was acting out pretty heavily and she refused to discipline him. She would scream at me if I even suggested thinking about it. I just thought a time out and a stern lecture would do him some good. I also told her he probably just misses her and is trying to get her attention. Spending time with him might help. She said I was telling her opposite things and I'm not a parent and don't know a single thing about kids. I grew up babysitting and spent years taking care of my brother's kids. She called a therapist who told her the same thing I did. And when she called to tell me, she blamed me for taking care of him. She told me I should have told her that he was missing her and that she should have spent time with him. I was done. I told her that she was a horrible mother who put her kids in danger. She took her oldest to a concert knowing her crazy husband was there. He then tried to follow her home. I told her she was verbally abusive. I tried to point it out so many times and she told me I was a horrible guest because I snored in my sleep and left dishes in the sink. She told me I was unreliable. I had a job interview once and that I didn't actually care for her kids. I loved them. I told her I was done watching her kids for her and I was so sick of her BS towards me. I told her that she needed to pick up the stuff she left here for her kids and lose my number. When she came to pick it up, she tried lying to tell my mom that I threatened to hurt myself if she stopped being my friend, using my past against me. She tried getting my parents to choose her over me because she has kids. My dad told her to just leave. She also threatened to call the cops because I refused to hand deliver her stuff to her window. She treated me like a slave most days, and other days like I owed her. It takes a lot for me to walk away from someone, especially if that person has kids and does need help. Karen was just too horrible. Before she left, 
She told me that no one would love me and I was going to die alone. When I found the $80 key fob to her car she left me in case of emergencies, I threw it in the trash. Several years of harassment caused her to lose a job and her kids. Several years ago, my mom was dating this nice man with two kids. My younger brother and I liked the boyfriend himself, but his kids were another story. His kids were entitled jerks that always got what they wanted, constantly stole our toys, and were generally a nuisance to be around. I always tried to be a better person, but my brother and I were constantly getting into arguments with them due to their pettiness. They weren't even the worst part of the relationship. The boyfriend's ex-wife was. From my perspective, I felt that she was the type of person that if she couldn't have him, nobody could. She made my mother and our lives heck. Constantly filing false complaints about our side of the family generally pointed at my brother and I. From harassment to claiming I had stolen the son's toys, which was the other way around, and going after the boyfriend claiming he was an unfit parent. Several times she'd try and ruin any plans we had come up with. For example, after spending months planning a trip to New York, last minute she blew a fuse and demanded we cancel the trip so that she could take her own trip with them. We had already gotten written agreement from her. One time she even demanded the oldest son and I visit a family therapist after pointing all the blame on me. I told my side of the story. It resulted, without the therapist fully implying, that they agreed I was in the right and them storming out of the room. Among many other reasons, even after my mom and her boyfriend had gotten engaged, the ex-wife was one of the biggest reasons why mom had decided to call off the engagement. The harassment and drama were just too much for us. It broke her heart to do so, but she made us the priority and got us out of that situation. A few years after the breakup, my small family and I were living happily. I never saw the kids or the dude again. My mom had still kept in touch with the former boyfriend but after some time apart, she's seen the faults in him too. I was in the 8th grade and living life happily. That was until the ex-wife stepped into gym class one day. Apparently, since the breakup, she had gotten her teaching degree and became a substitute teacher. She was now replacing our normal gym teacher who was on maternity leave as well as acting as the assistant teacher for our health class. Basically, I now had to see her pretty much every day for the rest of the school year. At first, she didn't recognize me. Puberty had hit me hard, changing my appearance drastically, and especially for someone who hadn't seen me in like 5 years. Eventually, she recognized my name, and that's when the harassment began anew. All of it was snide remarks about my appearance, constantly pointing me out as an example as to what puberty can negatively do to you. Pimples, facial hair, voice cracking, that sort of stuff. To the class, as if I was the only one dealing with it. The main health teacher didn't know about it either. Basically, everyone in the 8th grade was taking this class at the time. It was technically one large class, but split up into male and female groups, and wasn't I lucky that the ex-wife got the male half, mine. I told my mom about it immediately, and she was livid. She sent multiple emails to the school requesting that they switch teachers or at least let me take the class online. It all fell on deaf ears, until with the help of the ex-boyfriend, we showed them dozens of emails, phone calls, and messages all spouting harassment at my family and I. This resulted in her being fired from the school and basically being blacklisted from our school district and the surrounding area. If she wanted another teaching job, she would have to find it elsewhere. This resulted in a major legal battle between her and the ex-boyfriend because she had tried to move out of state with the kids without his nor the court's permission. Apparently, she lost custody of the kids and had to go back to her old job. Don't know what it was. All in all, it was an interesting experience. We cut all ties with that family after the whole ordeal and went on with our lives. I'm now a sophomore in college, waiting out the lockdown in my state. While my mom still hasn't had a long-term relationship since then, she's happier than she's been in a long time. Entitled Mom says I don't need my Xbox because I'm fat and tries to take it. Some backstory. So the entitled mom of this story was one of my dad's friends. She had a great life growing up and got a lot of the things she wanted, so she wanted the same for her kid. My parents had been great friends with her, shared a lot of their life with her, five years to be exact, and everything was great. Christmas had come around and I had gotten an Xbox One X as a present. I have been overweight for several years of my life and have gotten very self-conscious about it, to which makes me sensitive to comments and insults about my weight. Also, I would like to mention, Entitled Brat was around 9 to 10 at the time of this story. Now for the main story. 
So this happened about two months ago. My parents invited some friends over and a family for a party. They wanted to throw one because they hadn't had one in a while and they felt like getting some stress off their shoulders. Like the introvert I am, I stayed upstairs and played on my Xbox. My parents had invited over Entitled Mom and she brought Entitled Brad because his dad was away for a couple of days because he had to go to an interview. After a lot of the people left, some people stayed for a little while. This included Entitled Mom and Entitled Brad. My mom told Entitled Brad that I was upstairs and he could hang out with me because he was very bored from hanging out with the adults. He came upstairs and into my room. Entitled Kid What are you doing, OP? Me I'm playing some Minecraft. Can I try? Now, me being a softie for kids and being nice to them, I offered to let him play. He played for an hour or so when I asked him to stop so I could keep playing. I'm sorry, but I will have to admit I'm kind of addicted to video games, so I was a little impatient. Me. Hey, Entitled Brad, it's my turn now. No, I want to keep playing. Me. But it's my Xbox, and if I want to play, you have to let me. You can't tell me what to do. You're not my mom. But it's my Xbox, and I want to play, so I'm going to play, whether you like it or not. Now that was a big mistake on my end for saying that. That caused Entitled Brad to start to whine that he wants to play. Me. Well, it's my turn to play, so move it along now. I pushed him to the side of me so I could start playing some Sky Wars. He started throwing a tantrum, saying, I want to play. It's my turn. Stuff like that. Entitled Mom heard his whining and came upstairs to see what was happening. Entitled Mom. OP, what is going on? Me. I'm trying to get Entitled Brad to move over and let me play on my Xbox because he already had a turn. He played for an hour. Oh, just let him play, OP. You get to play this every day while he doesn't even have an Xbox. Me. It's my Xbox, and if I want to play, I'm going to play. Oh, come on. You don't even need that Xbox in the first place. What? You're already fat enough. And if you have this Xbox every day, you'll just get fatter and fatter for the rest of your life. Now that comment really tilted me off my foundation because I hate any comment or insult that has to do with my weight. And I retaliated. Me. Then why don't you buy your son his own Xbox? That thought ever struck your empty mind? Entitled Mom, clearly shocked about what I had said. How dare you swear in front of my son? Why can't I? I don't have the right to? Entitled Mom. Listen here, punk. I am not having any of this crap from you. Understand? Now let my son play on your stupid Xbox. Me. No. Entitled Brad. Mummy, I want to play on the Xbox. Entitled Mom. I know, honey. Just give Mummy a second, okay? Entitled Brad starts fake crying, trying to make it as believable as possible because he knows his mother will chew anyone out if he's upset because of them. Look what you did to my baby. You're making him cry. Just let him play on the Xbox, you insolent jerk. Now my mom starts hearing Entitled Mom screeching and runs upstairs. Mom, what the heck is going on up here? Your rude kid just made my poor boy cry because he won't let him play on the Xbox. Just tell him that he is wrong and Entitled Brad should play. Mom, look Entitled Mom, it's not my decision on who gets to play on the Xbox. It's OP's. But it was a gift! You bought it for him! And now it's his property. Got a problem with that? Entitled Mom sighs. Probably one of the loudest and most overly dramatic sighs I have ever heard. We all settle down and go downstairs. After 30 minutes downstairs, Entitled Mom says that Entitled Brat has to go to the bathroom and she goes with him. Me. What the heck? Isn't he like 9? He should be able to go on his own. Sheesh. After we play Monopoly for 10 minutes, we hear a loud thunk from upstairs and whining from Entitled Brad. Me. Oh no. I go upstairs and who better to be there than Entitled Mom with my Xbox sitting on the carpet, cables ripped out of the outlets, TV nearly tilted off my dresser. Me. What the heck are you doing Entitled Mom? You don't deserve this Xbox, you rude jerk. Give me my Xbox back, now. While I'm arguing with Entitled Mom, I hear some fast footsteps go down the stairs and clunking of plastic and metal in a paper bag. Entitled Brad just ran off with my controllers. My dad notices Entitled Brad running down the stairs with the bag and stops him. Dad, what you got there, little man? Nothing. Let me see that. He opens the bag to find all three of my controllers. Dad, 
And why do you have OP's Xbox controllers? Entitled Brad. Because my mommy told me to take them. He tries getting past my dad to get out of the house, but he stops him. What? Give me that bag and come with me. He comes to my room to see my Xbox on the ground with the cables on top of it and me and Entitled Mom arguing. Dad. What's going on in here, OP? Me. This crazy lady's trying to take my Xbox. She also insulted me on my weight. Dad. Entitled Mom. You know that OP is sensitive. I don't care. He's a rude and ignorant little jerk who doesn't care about other people. My dad is very protective of me for several reasons. Because of how fragile I am. Because of how bad my mental health was at the time. And also he's very supportive. My dad doesn't approve of anyone talking about me like that. Get out, Entitled Mom. No, I'm not leaving until I have that ex- I said get out! My dad is a very intimidating guy. Even though he isn't over six feet, he is a powerhouse when it comes to strength overall. Entitled Mom flees my house, empty-handed with her brat. Dad, look OP, don't take what Entitled Mom said to heart, okay? You're a very smart and caring boy, and your weight doesn't matter, so don't worry about it. Me. Thanks, Dad. I finally snapped on a Karen. Recently found me a job that I really enjoy. I worked both my old job at the restaurant and my new one for a while till I was able to fully start the new job. It's been a couple of weeks since I quit the restaurant and I went in to pick up my last check. They are doing to-go orders only, like a lot of places are right now. I went up to the cashier station and my friend was the only person working and one cook. So I just started talking to her about what had been going on and my new job and stuff while she got my check from under the counter. The kitchen yelled, order up, that echoed through the whole empty restaurant. So she went to grab the order and I stayed at the front waiting for her to come back. I was standing next to the cashier stand, not behind it. A car pulled up and parked in front of the restaurant in a handicapped spot and I noticed they didn't have any stickers to park there. I recognized the lady from when I used to work there. She's a total Karen jerk that every single person working here hated her. She always had many complaints and almost never tipped. She would come in with a group of two to three more Karens and run the waitress around for two hours and then not tip her. She even made a new girl cry one day. So I started to walk to the back to get my friend and so Karen wouldn't say anything to me, but she obviously recognized me from when I worked here. Some of this is paraphrased because I was so angry I don't remember exactly word for word. Karen screaming red in the face. I want a refund. I'm so fed up with you all not knowing how to do your job. Me. Let me get someone to help. No. You will give me my money back right this second. I'm never coming back here again. That girl said she checked the order, but it's wrong. I was here a few minutes ago and ordered grilled catfish and there's no tartar sauce in it. How am I supposed to eat fish with no tartar sauce? And I never got the Dr. Pepper I paid for. She looked like she's about to explode with anger. I was starting to feel angry too. Karen. And then I drove here twice already. I want my money for the gas I wasted. Me. Okay, just let me go get someone to help you. I will admit I said it in a snappy way. I do not appreciate anyone talking to me like that. She noticed and immediately started cussing me out. And my friend came out from the back asking what happened. Karen starts yelling at her and I went to the back. I quickly asked the cook for tartar sauce while I made a Dr. Pepper and then walked back up to Karen as she was still demanding a refund and $50 for gas. There's no way she used $50 of gas. She's insulting my friend and saying I was rude to her. I just want to say that what I'm about to do, some of you might think is wrong, but after working years in customer service and having to put up with little jerks like her, I saw this as a once in a lifetime opportunity to finally give them a taste of their own medicine. I mean, what are they going to do? Fire me? I don't work here anymore. Me. Nobody likes you. You are the biggest jerk I've ever met. She looked at me wide-eyed, frozen in shock. Me. You really think it's okay to just come here and not tip? And then treat everyone like they are worthless? Why are you like this? Always such a nasty attitude. Thinking you're better than everyone. I'm sorry your life is so miserable that you constantly have to put others down. Here's your stuff and you can shove it. I set the tartar sauce and the drink on the counter. Not going to lie, I really thought about throwing it at her. Then I just walked out with my check before she could say a word to me. Although I think she was stunned silent, no one probably has ever talked to her narcissistic self like that before. 
I went home and started telling my boyfriend about it, and before I could even get a few sentences out, the owner of the store is calling me. He wanted me to apologize, and I said no way. So now I'm forever banned from going back there. My friend said that Karen threw the biggest fit after I left, screaming for the manager and the owner, and she almost called the police. Really happy I didn't throw that drink at her now. I did feel bad for leaving her with that mess, but she said she was thoroughly entertained by the situation, and she wishes she could have cussed her out too. I really wish I said more to Karen, because on my way home, I thought all kinds of stuff I could have said. I think this has been building in me for a while, and I finally snapped. Honestly, I do not regret a single word I said to her. How a Meatball Sub Ended in Divorce While at my Subway store, I'm the manager. Our franchise general manager comes in to do a review of my employees, and I received a call from another nearby store of ours in need of some product. So I head out to transfer the product to another store, so the first part of this is all secondhand from our general manager. My big burly closer has a middle-aged Karen, haircut and all, come in. She's ordered food for herself and her husband in the car. My general manager can see them both from his seat in the lobby. He's watching my closer make the sandwich via our cameras while paying attention to his customer service, correct questions, politeness, etc. She orders a club for herself and a meatball sandwich for her husband. She proceeds to ask for a little extra sauce and then piles it full of toppings he had asked for. Gets rather demanding as my closer is adding the toppings per subway regulation, even for extra, making her ask multiple times. Of course, my general manager is in the store, and I'm not there to take the heat if he doesn't. Something I did for my employees, especially him, since I relied on him to keep my already long work weeks below 80 hours when people called out. Man's a saint of patience. She's rude, but nothing abnormal for fast food. She takes her food. Husband and Karen proceed to go home to eat. I return from the other store and sit with our general manager in the dining area. We go over what went down while I was gone, how my closer did, fantastic of course, and he catches me up on the owner's focus for the store and drama from other stores. He used to be my manager for a year before we both got promoted. Then in comes Karen's husband, the poor divorcee. He comes in livid, swinging our front door hard enough I thought it was going to slam against the store next door's windows. He starts, Do you know what you've done? Pointing to my closer, who is twice his size by the way, and usually a gentle giant. Closer, is there something I can help you with? He's obviously confused, considering he could not have seen the husband sitting in the car. Husband, Yeah, you can pay my alimony and buy me a new house. She's going to take me for everything, and it's all your fault. I'm going to sue you, the store, the owner, Subway. General manager and I stand up to handle it. My general manager rests his hand on my shoulder and tells me he has this. General manager. Sir, what exactly has happened? Your employee put too much sauce on my sandwich, fell out onto my pants, and my wife got angry. The argument ended with us getting a divorce. You are going to pay for it. General manager. Oh, sure, I'm sorry to hear about that. I'd be happy to give you a free sandwich. Free sandwich? What? General manager. But holding up a hand to have husband let him finish. If meatball sauce on your pants is causing a divorce, I hate to tell you that your marriage had problems long before this. Karen's husband then spills an incoherent set of sounds before storming out and peeling out of our parking lot. In the end, Karen's husband sent in a complaint to corporate. Our corporate contact came in the next month for his inspection and asked me about it. I brought up the cameras and audio of the evening. He chuckled and smiled. Corporate. Please email this to me too, will you? Me. Sure. May I ask why? Corporate. One proves we have no fault in this divorce in case of suit. Two, and most importantly, it's hilarious and my coworkers have to see this. So that's how a meatball sub ended a marriage. Customer tried to get me to hurt myself. This happened about six years ago when I was working for a well-known high street fashion retailer as an assistant department manager. I was working at the till, training a new starter when a woman strolled up, placed a shoebox on the counter, opened the lid, took out a boot, and asked me to put my hand all the way inside. Why would you like me to do that, was my response. Just do it, she demanded. I kept refusing politely, all the while asking her why she wanted me to do that. She got madder and madder, and louder and louder, and this attracted the attention of staff and customers alike, including my manager. She knew I could handle things, so she stayed out of it, but waited to see what was going on. After maybe five to seven minutes of this repetitive back and forth, the woman screamed, 
Because there's a metal spike in the toe, and I wanted you to get hurt like I did. So, you're telling me that because of a manufacturing defect that caused you pain, you thought it was okay to try and bully me into getting hurt too? Why not? It's only right. Well, a normal person would have come in, told us about the fault, we'd have been deeply apologetic, and then tried to make amends in some way. But you chose to try and inflict bodily harm on an innocent person? She then swung at me, trying to claw me with her nails. I dodged that, just as my manager and another colleague grabbed her from behind and restrained her. The police were called, and she was carted off. Sadly, I never learned what became of her. On later inspection, the metal spike turned out to be a small plastic shard or spur of some kind, maybe two millimeters long at most. It was a bit jagged and slightly sharp. Entitled Mom tries to get me to give my Easter basket to her kids. I live in an apartment complex with my boyfriend. I work overnight, so usually I'm asleep during most of the day. Yesterday, my boyfriend went out and bought stuff to make up an Easter basket for me, something we did for each other last year, but hadn't really talked about doing this year because of what's going on. He set the basket up and left it in the passenger seat of my car for me to find when I went to work. This morning, I got home around 7.30, and as I was walking through the parking lot, a couple of the neighbor kids were playing outside. I'm pretty sure they're brothers, as I always see them together. And I passed them to go upstairs while carrying my basket. The basket itself is a pink wicker basket. It had a small pink stuffed bunny, a giant lollipop set, a chocolate bunny, and plenty of colored eggs in it. I had just taken a melatonin and put my sleep mask on to try to get to bed when I hear a knock at my door. My boyfriend is fast asleep, so I figured I might as well look through the peephole to see if it was an Amazon delivery or something. I peek through and see my neighbor from over the stairs, so I open it up. The two boys from earlier were by her door watching our conversation. Entitled Mom My boys said you had an Easter basket. Me Uh, yeah? Okay, so give it to them. Me I'm sorry? Give them the Easter basket. You're an adult. Why do you even have one? Me, I'm not going to give your kids my Easter basket. Well, why not? Do you not like Jesus or something? I stood there for a second with a confused look on my face before she snapped. Give them the basket already. Me, look, I've lived here almost a year. I see your kids all the time and I've never really interacted with them, but they seem like okay kids. Even if that is true though, I don't have to give them anything, especially not something that was given to me as a gift. If they want Easter baskets, and you want them to have Easter baskets, why don't you buy the supplies and make them up yourself? Why would I have to do that when there's one already made up here? Because it isn't yours? Well, I'm sure it'll get much better use if my boys have it rather than you. Hand it over or I'm going to call the police and tell them some girl from my apartment stole their basket. Me, you might think it'll get more use from your kids than it will for me, but it's all sweets that I'm going to eat to keep me awake during my 12 hour shift tonight. The one I need to go to sleep before if you would leave me be. After that, I closed the door in her face. I could actually hear her through the door give off one of those partial groan, partial screams that she actually called the police on speaker right outside of my door. It's possible the police did show up after I fell asleep, but if so, I have no recollection of it. Melatonin knocks me out and it's hard to wake me up even without it. So if anyone would have answered the door, it would have been my boyfriend who also used to be a police officer. To those of you saying I should have slammed the door in her face right after she asked, you're right. I wish I had so I wouldn't have had to deal with such stupidity when I was so tired already. To those of you saying I shouldn't have opened the door regardless because of what's going on, you're also right. The only reason I opened the door was because I recognized her as my neighbor and I know she's a single mother with three kids in her home. And to my knowledge, she isn't working at the moment. So I thought she was just coming to ask for something like milk or a couple eggs or something, which I would have probably given her if that were the case. To so those of you saying to report her to my apartment management, my boyfriend has been living in this complex for over five years and is very close with management. So if anyone would report anything he or I did, management would call him and ask, hey, what happened with so-and-so? But we reported our upstairs neighbor for things and nothing has been done about it. Those of you saying just report it for a paper trail, 
I've lived in the apartment almost a year and haven't had an issue with the family until today, so I don't think much more will happen with her. Or at least, I hope not. Her kids are in middle school, which starts at around 7 something in the morning here, so they're used to being awake as early as 7.30. It's possible they haven't stopped their school alarms and are still waking up early in the morning, and before the craziness, I'd seen them playing in the parking lot as I got home from work multiple mornings. Nobody usually bothers them when they play, and when they see a car coming through the lot, they grab whatever they're playing with and move to the side for the car to get through. They seem to be very respectful, as every time I've been outside to clean out my car or just walk through the lot to get my mail, they step aside and stop playing so they don't hit anyone with their ball. Usually a football or basketball, some occasions a soccer ball. Return of the Crazy Walmart Karen Who Ran Over My Foot So, I posted a story ages and ages ago about how a woman ran over my foot at Walmart with a motorized cart. After this happened, she was banned from our local Walmart and from a few in the area, which I forgot to mention. I got fed up with the comments. First of all, gonna update on my injured foot. I was just fine. Lots and lots of bruising and the occasional pain still, but I did take a little break and stayed off for a bit. I'm all healed now. Second, guess who managed to show her face again? Crazy lady. And I guess she figured out the easy trick of changing her appearance a bit and came with someone else and went back in. No issues. My Walmart is usually good about this kind of stuff, but I guess not this time. Third, this was not very recent. And of course, I just so happened to be there again with my blue lanyard, a pair of jeans, and a sweatshirt. I was shopping around, picking up a few unnecessary objects. I saw her staring at me at one point and waved, earning no reaction other than a scoff. I knew she looked familiar, but I couldn't place her face. I work three jobs and I see about a bazillion different faces a day and have trouble remembering unless I see that person more than a few times. What I didn't notice for a while, because I'm very unobservant, was that she was following me. For how long, I don't know, but I noticed I was seeing her everywhere. The auto center, office supplies, dairy, baking supplies, even toys. I didn't know what she wanted from me. She had another woman with her too. Dark haired, bob cut, dark makeup, and a low cut t-shirt with tight jeans and heels. She just had this dark scowl on her face as they followed me. I didn't recognize her either. Until I heard Crazy Lady's voice. That horrible, shrill sound that haunted my nightmares when my foot hurt and sent chills down my spine and dogs running. We were in the craft aisle where I was looking for a specific type of paint. I noticed them again, and I guess I looked a little too long. Crazy Lady turned to who I will call the Entitled Lady and grabbed a paintable sign at random. Crazy Lady, loudly. Look at this, Entitled Lady. Doesn't this just look perfect? That made my brain do a 360. Dear God, why was she here? She wasn't supposed to be here. Entitled Lady. Oh, Mom, it's great. She turned to me. Isn't this just wonderful? I gave a quick nod, grabbing the next best thing to what I needed. Needed matte fabric paint, if you're curious. I grabbed Slick instead and started to leave. They kept following me, and I grabbed a pair of jeans and hid in a changing room. It felt like an eternity waiting for the door to be unlocked, but luckily, Crazy Lady's scooter got stuck. I sat on the bench and waited to see if I lost them, but suddenly, bang! I couldn't help but scream as the flimsy door to the changing room nearly fell off its hinge. Entitled Lady. Get out here. We know who you are. You owe my mother for what you did. Bang! Bang! I just sat in the corner and watched in horror as the door fell to the ground. I had to put my hands up to catch it and push it away. Otherwise, it would have landed on my head. She looks at the ripped apart wall from where the hinges had been ripped off and she shrugged before climbing over and getting in my face. Entitled Lady You will be coming with me. You owe my mother compensation for getting her banned. Me, shrinking into the corner. No, I won't. Leave me alone. Y your mother shouldn't be here if she's banned. I probably shouldn't have said that because it more than likely prompted what happened next. But I've never been one to say the right thing. Entitled Lady grabbed me by my hair and pulled me out of the changing room, pulling me over to Crazy Lady who was sitting there looking smug. Entitled Lady literally threw me on the ground by pushing on my head and letting me go. Apologize, now! I sat there shaking, and both ladies started shouting again, screaming that I owed them. Thankfully, this didn't last too long, as the associate who was posted at the changing room 
They never stuck around long once someone was in the change room or if no one was around, and another worker came over, separating the three of us. While the associate was helping me off the floor, Crazy Lady actually got up from her motorized scooter and tried to lunge at me. I held my hand out so that it caught her and pushed her back. She started screaming about how I assaulted her, and one of the associates pretty much told her to shut up and wait for the police. Well, they showed up, and since there were a few security cameras nearby, of all the things, this Walmart is concerned with things being stolen via changing room tricks, and a few witnesses, including the poor lady in the room next to me, who was so scared that someone was coming for her next. Apparently, when the door fell, the corner of the door cracked the wall to her room. And, due to what happened last time, and even despite how I usually react to these kinds of things, I press charges. Hopefully, I won't have to deal with this kind of thing happening again. Having to re-meet the entitled people in my life might be worse than meeting more. Treat prank calls seriously? Okay, have fun making 200 extra large pizzas. I work in a major pizza delivery chain that has so far been unsuccessful in out pizzaing the HUD. Our store is in a college town and everyone is bored as heck right now for obvious reasons. So we've gone from maybe one prank call a day to at least three to five, which isn't much but still really annoying with how much more business we've been getting, again, for obvious reasons. The worst part is how uncreative and low effort most of them are. At least 80% of them are, can I get a boneless pizza? Or is this the Krusty Krab? With the occasional insert GTA fast food order copy pasta here. This has been going on way too long, so I took up the habit of just hanging up whenever someone starts saying something stupid. The boss wasn't too happy about this, but didn't care enough to say anything until an incident where I hung up on someone who wanted that boneless pizza and he called back upset because he actually wanted to order. So I get a stern talking to from boss man and he sends a message to the company's group chat app saying, I know we've been getting more prank calls than usual, but please don't follow in certain people's footsteps and just hang up on them. Take the calls as seriously as possible. If they order something we can't make, calmly explain it to them and offer them something we do actually sell. We want to try to make money off of them, even if they are acting dumb. So the very next call is where the fun starts. Thank you for calling. What can I get you? I'm so hungry. Can I get an extra, 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 extra large pizza with triple every topping? I'm sorry, ma'am. We can only go up to one extra and double each topping. Hmm, okay then. Can I get 20 extra larges of each meat y'all have? Like 20 pepperoni, 20 sausage, etc.? It's obviously a prank, and there's giggling in the background the whole time. Sure, give me a sec to ring it all up. Okay, so that's 180 pizzas. The total will be $1,000. Don't remember the actual price, but close enough. And it'll take about three hours. Awesome, thanks. We'll pay with a check when we get there. Dial tone. So I place the order, and not 30 seconds later, I hear, What the heck? from the boss, and he runs to the computer. How are they paying for this? He asks me. They said with a check. We do still take checks for orders over $200, right? They can't have been serious. Was this a prank call? Not sure, boss. You said take all calls seriously. He just grumbles and picks up the phone and calls the customer, and all I hear is super loud laughter as he hangs up. Meanwhile, other employees have started actually making the ridiculous order, not noticing anything weird about it. So by the time the boss finishes the call and cancels the order on the computer, there are already five extra large pepperoni pizzas in the oven. So we got free dinner for everyone working that night, as well as another message in the group chat app simply saying, in regards to my last message, please just use good judgment when taking orders. Entitled mom throws trash when I refuse to let her son ride in my car. Yesterday, I was asked to drive my car in a little Easter bunny parade that went past the homes of kids in the community with disabilities. The point of this was to bring a little happiness without getting close. I wasn't there to give rides. We were very clear about this point. The car in question is my very loved 1979 Corvette C3 that my son and I have been taking pride in restoring. She's loud, fun, and very delicate in places due to age. The passenger side door does not lock at the moment and I had the T-tops off. There are five cars in our little parade. I'm third, right in front of the truck with the guy in the bunny suit. We were going to drive past seven homes in the community. 
Most were sitting outside enjoying the sunshine when we came by and waved, laughed at us. We had stopped for a minute and move on to the next address. It was fun. Until we pulled up to Karen's house and her three kids ran up to the bunny truck and tried to climb in the back. They were all screaming for candy, which we did not have. After several minutes of all of us yelling at Karen to get her kids, they backed up, making unhappy noises and complaining. I noticed her kid who was about 11 or 12 looking at my car and then he walked over. Entitled Kid Hey, I like your car. He put his hands on the door. Me. Thank you. Do you remember what we just said? No getting close because people are sick. He didn't move. I need you to move away from my car. He didn't. Entitled Kid I want a ride. Can I have a ride? My mom says that no one's sick. I want a ride. He starts trying to get... <laughs> He starts trying to get the door open, which isn't easy in that car as the mechanism needs work and you have to push in from the top and pull. He gets frustrated and kicks the door panel. Me. Hey! Knock it off! Do not kick my car! He kicks the door again and starts whining that he's bored and wants a ride. No way! I'm not giving you a ride! Entitled Kid tries yanking on the door again, then walks to his mother. He pulls her over to my car. Entitled Mom. My son wants to ride with you. Open the door. Me. I don't want anyone riding in my car, let alone a kid that just kicked my door. Move him away. Stop being a jerk and just let him sit beside you for a minute. Not like I'm telling you to let him drive. He's not old enough yet. She tries the handle and the door clicks open. I grab the handle inside and slam it back closed. Me. Get away from my car. Do not open the door again. Entitled mom laughs. Come here, entitled kid. She picks up her brat and tries to lift him into the car through the open tops. His feet walk up to the door, but he doesn't make it in before his mom slips and they both fell backwards. Naturally, it's my fault this happens. She gets herself up and starts screaming at me, which alerts the others and her, I assume, husband who comes over. Husband. Entitled mom, what are you doing? Me. Sir, would you please get these two away from my car before they cause any damage? I do not want Entitled Kid to ride with me. Entitled Mom says something I don't understand. Husband. Entitled Kid, go back to the house now. Entitled Mom. What? He just wants a ride. She and her son finally walk away. Husband. Sorry about that, ma'am. She gets an idea and she just can't let go of it. Me. It's okay, as long as my car isn't damaged. He nods and walks off. This exchange only took about five minutes or so. We were all ready to leave for the next house. As I was pulling away, something fell into the seat beside me. An empty can. Entitled mom was digging crap out of her trash can and was throwing it at me. Entitled parent demands we stop eating. Backstory. It was my cousin's birthday and she wanted to go out to eat at the Texas Roadhouse. It's kind of like the Longhorn Steakhouse, or if any of you know what that is, but it's with country music and sports. The one I went to was a private room with no windows other than the one with the view of the city. The room had just enough space for one party at a time, so we were the only ones there. We were eating for a long time because of the birthday, but then I saw her. Enter the entitled parent. So we've got me, my mom, my dad, my aunts one and two, my uncle, the entitled parent, the manager, my cousin one, the birthday girl, my cousin two, and my big brother. I saw the entitled parent walk up to the table briskly. She had a bright pink purse and what looked like a clear Axe bottle spray bottle filled with something. Her two kids, who seemed about 8 to 10, walked in tow. Entitled Parent Hello, are you the people that have been eating for an hour? Dad Yes, it's cousin's birthday and we're waiting for dessert. Entitled Parent Me and my kids are very hungry. Please leave now. I had a reservation for this room and I have been waiting for an hour. We knew this was BS because when we booked the room, we said we were going to be there for at least two hours. Me. Just wait. It's packed today, but please leave us alone. Entitled Parent. Shut up, brat. You're just selfish and you don't want my babies to eat. Everyone but me, my dad, my brother, and my two cousins started whispering to each other. Brother. Just leave us alone so we can celebrate her birthday. The Entitled Parent storms off and the 10-year-old apologized for his mom. We thought that was it, but right when dessert came to the table is when Entitled Parent stormed over. Eat quickly! Dad, leave us alone or I'll get management. Entitled Parent reached for her clear bottle. She then stated it was a spray bottle of vinegar. 
and said that if we don't leave at that moment, <laughs> she'll spray us. You would think it's not that bad, but apple cider vinegar is not that nice. Dad, we're not leaving. Entitled mom then starts spraying. We all got up and ran for management, but my dad fought back. When the manager came over, he saw my dad having entitled parent pinned to the ground and the bottle far away on the floor. Manager, what is happening? Dad, she tried to spray us. This man tried to hurt me, then he beat me up. Entitled parent 2's kids stepped in. Kid 1, no, that's not true. He looked like he was like 10. Kid 2, mommy tried to force them to stop eating. Manager, is this true? We all agreed. Entitled parents started denying it, so then the manager brought us to the camera room and she was forced to watch as she was proved wrong. The kid's dad was called and he picked them up. The cops were called and asked if we wanted to press charges. My dad said yes and we went on with the dessert. The manager already took the desserts and got us fresh ones. The entire meal was free and he apologized for the accident. We also saw people leave because of the smell from the bottle of vinegar. This may seem fake, but I assure you this was not. The experience sucked, but at the end we got a free meal. My family still jokes about it, and it's something we'll never forget. I still can't believe that happened. Does it look like I work here? Backstory. I work at a Texas roadhouse as a waiter. My friend is a Papa Gino's assistant manager. The uniform shirts are alike, but my uniform is a black button-up with the logo on the chest, while theirs is a black t-shirt with a name on the back. Story time. Now my friend was in another state for a couple months and I couldn't see her for a while, but got word of her coming back today. So after work, I drove to her work and asked the manager if I could go into the break room and wait for her. I got the nod of, sure, but don't cause trouble while I clock out. I'm well known by the casuals in the store and they know I'm not an employee and I don't want to work at a pizza place. Not a big fan to be honest. I'm still in uniform and to keep my purple hair, important for later, out of the way of my eyes. Let's get to the juicy part of the story. I had walked out and went to pay and grab a drink for myself till I saw my old babysitter, an old lady who was a good friend of the family, and I walked over to see how she's been doing over the years. At this moment, a new customer walks into the building and sees the lines full of people, employees in the back making and cooking the pizzas. Lo and behold, there was my small, comedic, expressive self chatting with someone. The guy stays in line, and before even making his order, he complains about me and asks for the manager without thought. All of this going down, I think it's someone being mad about the pizza not being like Domino's or something. After a little longer, I say my goodbyes to the old woman and clean the table, inner waiter instincts, and head back to the break room. As I walk by, a cashier asks me to cover for a little bit while they get a shipment of supplies or something, I forget. So I sit at the register and have a notepad in hand and took orders. I had to take a minute with the register, which the casuals found amusing to watch me struggle, which I didn't mind entirely, cause they know I didn't do this. Once it clears up more, the star to the show steps up. This man has to be over 6 feet, and I'm about 5'4 to 5'5, so he towers over me. We've got angry guy, we've got me, and we've got my best friend. Angry guy. Now you wanna work? Me. Now I- what? Don't play dumb. I saw you talking to some old lady instead of helping earlier when it was packed and they needed your help. This is why I am the best at my job if I was working to do skits. I play along to my own idiotic desires and wanted to mess with the man to see how long till it hit him that I didn't work here. Me. Sorry to break it to you sir, but I am dumb because apparently I work at a pizza shop. Angry guy. Listen here you little brat. I want to get home and not waste my time with things like you. Me. Well, that must be horrible to think you can't leave till you get your food. I'll take your order. What would you like? Angry guy looks at me with a confused and angered look. My uniform is disgustingly different from the shirts the others have, and my visor hat was also blatantly saying my job, which I thought was pretty obvious. I guess I was wrong. Angry guy. Can I get something pizza and something breadsticks and blah blah blah? Me. Sorry sir, but we don't serve pizza or breadsticks. How about these items from the menu at Texas Roadhouse? Or how about a dessert? Angry guy was now getting mad. I just want a pizza. Me. Welcome to Texas Roadhouse. I was now just messing with him. This whole me messing with him went on for 10 minutes before my friend came in and almost cried laughing as she calls from the door. When did Roadhouse become a pizza house? Me. Well, aren't you clever? I sarcastically say and gesture to the man. 
He won't let me take his order. You try. Entitled neighbor called the cops on us for cleaning our home. So my boyfriend and I moved into an apartment in August. It's older, so the floors are super creaky. According to our lease, we're obligated to cover 90% of any room with carpet, except bathroom and kitchen, to help with the noise. It turned out our apartment was previously managed as a dorm by the local college, so the floors already have a layer of super thin crappy carpet. We also laid down more rugs to help with noise cancellation. Our downstairs neighbor moves in about a month later, and within a month of that, starts banging on her ceiling when we get too rowdy. The first couple times, it happened super late in the living room. Our apartments have the same plan. We were moving around after midnight the first time. Later, she came to talk to us and asked us to keep it down at night. Sure, fair enough. The next time was when we walked in from the airport at 10 p.m. She came up, banged on the door, and talked over my explanation. I told her I was sorry and asked when she was hearing the noise, assuming it was just the cat running around at night. No, she tells me that she knows it's not the cat. She knows it's us and she doesn't live alone. Okay, weird, but whatever. We started going to bed earlier as we settled into the apartment and our jobs, but the banging only continued. For months, she would hit the ceiling slash our floor whenever we walked around. Bed at 10? Bang! Wake up at 5.30 for work? Bang! Sitting on the couch but decide you want snacks? Bang! Around Christmas, she comes up to our door again. My boyfriend answered, and this time I recorded, and I'm so glad I did. This woman came up and looked my boyfriend in the eye and said, You have to stop following me. Uh, what? I know it's not the cat or your dog or your girlfriend, because I know your footsteps. I don't know how you figured it out, but you figured out how to listen to me where I am, and you're following me around my apartment and I'm sick of it. My boyfriend calmly responded that she sounds crazy and that we don't care about her. She again reminded us that she doesn't live alone. Her boyfriend is a small Latino man in his 60s who is very polite and has never said a word to us. Cool, she's insane, whatever. The banging continued with us stomping every time we heard it. She didn't like that, but it made it more fun. We had already explained the situation to the landlord and the super, and they were on our side. Our town was the first to be locked down, so for the first few days, the banging gradually increased until one day this woman lost her mind. I'll admit that we're early risers on the weekends. On this particular Sunday, we ended up waking up super early, but not doing much for the first few hours. We drank some coffee and sat on the couch until almost 11. At that point, we decided to get up and clean our apartment. Homegirl went crazy. She had to be running from one end of her apartment to the other. She's banging her ceiling so hard that we're convinced she's damaging it. At one point, I hear what sounds like muffled yelling after she's followed me into the bedroom. We had plans that day, so we ignored her, finished cleaning, and started to leave. She must have been waiting for us to leave, because for the first time ever, she walked out of her apartment right as we go to her landing. I was holding the dog while waiting for my boyfriend to come down, as she starts to descend the stairs. Of course, she decides to turn around and say something. Crazy lady, tell your boyfriend to cut it out. Me, cut what out? Walking? You're hitting the ceiling because of me and the dog moving, not him. Crazy lady, continues to spew some other dumb crap as my boyfriend gets down to me. She proceeded to stay exactly three steps ahead of him, slowing us all the way down the stairs. She tried to block us going out the door at the bottom, but backed off when he just didn't stop moving. She's continuing to yell at him all the way to the parking lot. Of myself and my boyfriend, he's typically the hothead while I'm the calm one. Amazingly, he kept his calm the whole time, calling her only a crazy lady and ignoring her as he walked past her and her car to the dumpster. As I passed her car, she decided to continue talking to me and I was just upset so I didn't engage. Crazy lady, I'm serious, it's done. Me, okay, what do you want us to do? Crawl? I already told you, we have a 60 pound dog and we're all just walking around. Crazy lady talking while I talked, so I don't hear everything. And you need to remember that I don't live alone. Me, okay jerk, neither do I. You see my boyfriend right there, so what's your point? By the way, that's the third or fourth time you've said that and that could be taken as a threat. 
You think it's a threat? Fine, it is. Me. Cool, I'm calling the cops. Okay, me too. We both call the cops and they pull up. They talk to her first and then come talk to us. I don't know what she told them, but when they came to talk to us, I told them everything she had said and done for the past six months. The officer explained that it was a civil matter that would have to be dealt with by the landlord, but assured us that they explained to her that it is perfectly acceptable to walk around your apartment at 11 a.m. on a Sunday. They also told her not to knock on our door ever again and that she's not allowed to bang on our floors over footsteps at any point. For a couple nights, she got back at us by banging at 1.30 a.m. to wake us up. We had already reached out to the landlord again, and this time, he told us he'd see what her problem is. That's still not the last of his troubles with her, though. We ended up talking to the people that live below her and telling them about the banging. It turns out, they've heard it this whole time and had no idea what it was. Now that they know, they've also reported her to the landlord. The banging has stopped. We don't expect her lease to be renewed, and we may end up in a better apartment in the next couple of months. Edit. A few comments have tried to paint my neighbor as an innocent in this. I want to clarify that she made direct threats to me when I apologized and told her we'd take care of it. That was the first time she met me, and all I did was apologize and say we'd fix it. She was never trying to be friendly and work it out. We have never engaged her. We have never provoked her. Have you ever had to deal with a crazy neighbor? And if so, how did you handle it? Karen demands I break her son out of jail. So, some quick background. I work in a county jail, and I'm the guy you want working the floor, housing units and roving. I'm pretty good at dealing with and talking to inmates, and I'm even better when we're past the point of talking. That being said, every officer is required to work a guard station at least once a month, even me. These stations are just dealing with the public, answering phones, and or opening and closing doors. Okay, cool. On one such guard station shift, Karen storms in. She's a southern kind of Karen. Totally unkempt hair, ratty clothes, at least five missing teeth, a criminal record that's largely drug-related charges, you know the type. She marches into my lobby and up to my bulletproof window. I hit the intercom and the following conversation ensues. Me. Can I help you? Karen. My son, entitled kid, needs to be released right now. He served his time and needs to come home. Me, looking up entitled kid on our computer. Ma'am, he's got a hold out of Blah Blah County. He'll have to go to court and serve time there first. No, he needs to be released now. His time here is done. He can go to Blah Blah County after he comes home. Me, already over it. Ma'am, this isn't a hotel. The law requires that he's in custody until he answers for all the crimes he's charged with. If I release entitled kid, I'll be fired and arrested. Aren't you supposed to serve and protect? Yes, I am. Entitled kid was charged with domestic assault and has felony charges in Blah Blah County. Keeping him in custody serves and protects the public. How dare you? My son is a good boy and he doesn't deserve this. The other inmates are threatening him. What are you going to do to serve and protect him? Me, suppressing a grin. Well, ma'am, I'll go ahead and make an announcement to the other inmates to leave him alone and that he called his mother and that she's not happy with their behavior. I'm sure that won't put him in any danger. I demand to speak to your supervisor. Me, knowing that Sarge is about the last guy you want to upset. It would be my pleasure to let you speak to my supervisor. Sarge arrives and asks Karen what the issue is. She rants and raves for about 15, I kid you not, minutes about her sweet boy being wrongfully incarcerated. My behavior, how Entitled Kid is in danger and he served his time. She concluded that if we didn't release Entitled Kid, she would raise heck in the lobby. At this point, Sarge raises his eyebrows in a look I know pretty well. It's a look that means, I'm genuinely impressed you're this stupid. Sarge, I remember you. You've been in jail before. Wonder where Entitled Kid got it. Karen goes to rant again. Sarge cuts her off. So much as fart in my lobby. Jail cops are going to arrest you on disorderly. Every officer was deputized and had been through police academy and patrol to boot. Entitled Kid is going to pay for what he's done on our schedule. Not yours and certainly not his. You are going to leave my jail and never come back. If you ever come back here again, you'll be charged with criminal trespass. 
Now why don't you go outside and play hide and go forget yourself? Karen doesn't even think about mouthing off again. She all but runs out of the lobby. Sarge and I have a laugh about it later. Amazingly, Karen never filed any complaints. Not that this would have got her anywhere. This is how the South do. Entitled Shopper Demands I Pay For Her Stuff This happened just an hour ago, and I'm laughing at the insanity and absurdity at the situation. So, as everyone is painfully aware, there's a little situation going on in the world, and we're on lockdown with the exception of going out for essential shopping. So, some backstory. My nan and I are close. She's the fifth member of our family. My dad, me, my brother, and my nan. And she's elderly, disabled, and asthmatic, so she's high risk and vulnerable. Now, I'm also severely asthmatic, and I probably shouldn't be going out shopping, but for my nan, I'm willing to risk it. So I go out to do her shopping at Morrison's. She gives me her shopping list, and I get what she needs slash what's available. So this entitled shopper started off by ramming me with her trolley while I was waiting to scan my items and pay, and was invading my personal space. Very rude. So I begin placing my items on the till, and she's just glaring at me for some reason and muttering to herself about me hurrying up. I place the divider and go to start bagging my items. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I had to rush for you. So as I'm bagging my items and about to pay, the cashier continues scanning strange items that I know I wasn't buying. I ask the cashier, what's going on? Those aren't mine. And the cashier is confused, saying there's no divider. I look up and this entitled jerk has removed the divider and now her items were being scanned and added to my bill. I tell the cashier and she starts to remove the items and sort the mistake. This is when Entitled Chopper goes insane. Excuse me, what are you doing? I'm confused and tell her that her items were accidentally being scanned and thinking that the divider must have been buried in the shopping and didn't think it was a big deal as the cashier was apologetic and sorted it. You need to pay for my shopping. I'm just shocked and simply say, what? She glares at me. My items were being scanned on your shopping, so you have to pay for them. And since you're paying for some now, you must buy my whole shopping. I give the cashier a look and am absolutely gobsmacked. What makes you think I'm going to buy your shopping? She scoffs and continues on about how a few mistakes mean I have to pay. I pay for my items and she still stood there expectantly waiting for me to pay for her shopping. I begin to walk away and she screams for me to come back. People are now staring, so I turn and say, Lady, I don't know you, and I don't have to buy your shopping for any reason. She then screams for security and feeds them some lie about me having to pay for her stuff. He called me over to ask what was happening, and I told him. She then went on admitting she removed the divider, thinking I wouldn't notice and I'd pay for her. Thankfully, the security guard just looked at her and told her the same thing I said, that I didn't have to. As I began walking away, she was screaming at the cashier, saying she didn't have any cash or cards on her to pay and was demanding her to honor some expired coupons. I left before anything else, so I don't know how it ended. So this lady thought she was entitled to her shopping and I had to pay for it as she didn't have any way to pay for it. Honestly, how can you be so stupid to not bring a means of paying for groceries? I'm wondering if she had tried it before and whether it worked on other people. I ain't buying someone else's shopping for no good reason. Entitled parent breaks glass all over the floor at my work and blames it on me. Backstory. When I was 17, I got a part-time job for the summer working in a restaurant where my mother worked also. It was big enough, but it was all open planning so you could see everything that was going on. This is important later. So I'm working one fine summer day and in comes Entitled Parent and her two brat kids who look to be about 8 and 10. I set them down with their menus and bring over a glass jug of ice water, as most restaurants do. As I set the jug down, her kids ask if they can have juice instead of water, and I tell them that unfortunately we are out of juice. We have dispensers in our wall that you can get the juice out of. Entitled parent calls BS to this and demands that I fill up the glass jug with juice. I then point to the empty dispensers and literally show her that we are out. At this point, her kids are screaming that they want juice, and I try to calmly tell them that we don't have any. Then Entitled Parent picks up the glass jug and just lets it drop to the ground, and it just shatters everywhere, then looks me in the eye and goes, Can I speak to your manager? However, the manager wasn't in that day, and when he's not in, my mother is in charge. 
So my mother comes over and asked her what was wrong. An entitled parent goes hysterical, saying that I threatened her by shattering the glass jug when they asked for juice. She then says that she's going to press charges against me and she wants me fired. But as I said before, this restaurant was all open planning and my mother had seen everything and knew that entitled parent was lying. I'm a tall girl, nearly 6'1", and I'm 17, so my mother wasn't exactly small either. I'd say maybe 5'11", which is pretty tall. So my mother literally bends down to entitled parent's height and puts on the voice that all mothers put on when someone messes with your kid and says, I saw everything that happened and I know that you're lying through your teeth and you better leave before I press charges for putting my daughter at risk by shattering a glass at close proximity that could easily have hurt her. So help me God, if I decide that I want to press charges, let me tell you that you will never be able to show your face in a restaurant in this area again. My mother is pretty high up in the restaurant industry in my area as she had been a chef in most of those restaurants. I swear, when Entitled Parent heard that I was the manager's daughter, her face turned so pale I thought she was going to faint. She grabbed her kids and rushed out of the door and thankfully we haven't seen her since. Entitled Woman Tried to Steal My Cart Okay, now this happened just this morning and it's still making me angry so I thought I'd lay it out here on Reddit to vent a little. A little bit of backstory is I have myotonic muscular dystrophy. I've had this all my life but symptoms do not really start to appear until your early 20s. I'm now 35 and my symptoms are quite noticeable to me. Although looking at me you can't see anything is wrong. Usually my most common problem is my legs and ankles. There are good days and bad days and sometimes really bad days. Most of the time I can endure the pain, been dealing with it for so long I try not to let it interfere with my daily life. But sometimes it's just not worth it so I try to minimize it when possible. Usually when I'm not having a good day, I stay home and just try to let my aching muscles recuperate and not agitate them more so. Sometimes it takes nothing to make them ache, sometimes it's just me being on my feet all day. It's random and sometimes without reason. Anyway, today was a bad day. My ankles are still killing me even as I write this right now, regardless of the fact that I really needed to go to the store. We finally ran out of food and I figured that since I was driving and could grab a motorized cart at the store, I wouldn't agitate my legs and ankles too much, so I strapped on my ankle braces and decided to brave to the store. I had just recently been given a handicap place card by my neurologist, so I was happy to be able to save myself as much walking as I could. I was greatly relieved to see one last motorized cart so I snagged it and began shopping. I wasn't going to make this a big trip. Usually my husband comes with me shopping, especially on my bad days, but he was on an on-call meeting at the time and those can take hours sometimes. I was surprised there was toilet paper and paper towels, so I grabbed one package of each and continued on my way. I went to the soda aisle and stood up to grab a two liter of Dr. Pepper and a small little old lady behind me politely asked if I could grab her some Coke on the top shelf. She was maybe five feet at most, and I'm about 5'7", so I moved to the side to grab her soda for her. When I took a step from my cart and grabbed the drinks, all of the sudden, some rather overweight woman sits in my cart and starts to drive away. I quickly put the drinks in the old lady's cart and run after my cart. It still had my purse and everything inside. I cringed from having to run. Even if it was a short distance, it still hurt. I placed myself in front of her. If she wanted to move, she would have to run me over. Hey, I say loudly, what do you think you're doing? This is my cart. You can't just take it away from me like that. It still has all my shopping inside. I say, looking at her in disbelief at what she has just done. She sneered at me. You don't need this card. I saw you standing up just a moment ago, so you can obviously walk. I saw you earlier using a handicap spot too. You're just faking it, she said. I was confused. Was this lady following me since the parking lot? I'm not faking anything. Get out of my cart right now, I said firmly. But I need it more than you. It hurts to walk and I could use everything in this cart, so it'll save me time. Come on, you should be nicer to your elders, she said. Now get out of my way. Like the conversation was over or something. Aside from the fact that sure, I might look young, but I was 35 and she was probably close to my age if not a bit older. I'm not moving. You will get out of my cart. I am not your personal shopper and I don't care if you're hurting. Has it ever crossed your mind I'm in pain too? And you are making it worse by stealing my cart and making me stand here. I will admit I was screaming at this point. 
I was near tears because I was so angry and hurting. Thankfully, a manager walked up and asked what was going on. But for once, I spoke before this horrid woman could say anything. I stood up, and when I was distracted, she stole my card. It had my purse and all my shopping inside, and she won't give it back, and I really need it. Please, I said, wanting desperately to sit down at this point. She's lying. This is all my stuff. She started yelling now too. Okay, let's all calm down. He picked up my purse and asked if the purse was hers. Of course, she said. Yes, of course, this is all mine. Okay then, ma'am. Will you please verify your name then? He said, pulling out my wallet to look at my ID. The look on her face was priceless. Um, why don't you ask her instead? Why are you asking me such a stupid question? She was stammering. Very well, ma'am, he asked me. My name is OP, I said. Why she thought asking me was going to do anything but prove this was my cart and stuff, I have no idea. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to return this cart to this lady. It's obviously hers and you had no right to take it, he said firmly. I need it more. She began to whine and scream. Get out of the cart or I will call security and have you removed. Now, do I need to call them? I was glad he was remaining so calm. She begrudgingly got up, kicking the cart as she did, and waddled away. I happily sat back down and thanked the manager for handling the situation so well and apologized if my yelling caused a scene. No worries. Did you need any help with the rest of your shopping today? I said I was okay and almost finished, but thanked him once more after getting his name. I called Walmart earlier about how helpful he was. I got the last of my stuff without incident and the employees were kind enough to take me to my car, load my groceries, and take the cart back for me too. Thanks for being a great Walmart. And thanks to my fellow Redditors for letting me vent. I needed that. Coworkers not doing their part, boss caught in the middle. This was some years ago when I worked for a small restaurant. I started out as a dishwasher and eventually moved to cook slash prep cook. Ended up working there for a couple of years. There came a point where during the busy summer months, as a dishwasher still, I would be busting my butt to make sure everything ran as smooth as possible throughout the restaurant. I'd help the servers with their tables. I'd of course clear tables as much as possible. I'd help with the kitchen staff restocking things as needed, and so on. The dishes of course were the job, but only so far as we could stretch things before closing time, after which the remaining dishes and any other things that needed doing throughout the restaurant would get taken care of. Sometimes this took some time to complete when the restaurant was super busy and things backed up really bad throughout the place. The thing is though, that while there are customers, serving them their food is the priority. So when push comes to shove, the thing that falls behind the most is always the dishes. My job. This led to a string of days, more than a week, where I was stuck in the restaurant an hour or more after close just getting all the dishes clean for the next day. One day was particularly bad when I was there until 1 a.m several hours after close. This was partly because it had been a really busy day, but also some customers staying late and so on. My boss told me the next day, I have noticed you've been closing later and later, and yesterday you closed way past midnight. What's the deal? I need you to close faster. I explained to her how the dishwashing took second place to the priority of serving people food, so the kitchen staff always got my help when they needed it, and the serving staff always got my help when they needed it too. However, at the end of the night, when the last customer left, the servers would finish resetting the tables and the kitchen staff would finish restocking things for the next morning and naturally the cleaning that needed doing all around would happen, but then everyone else left and I was stuck there washing dishes on my own with nobody helping me. Well, that's your job. You should be able to handle it. Yes, but I help them with their jobs, so at the end of the day when they're finished, they should help me with mine or else I'm going to be here longer, and that's just how it goes. All right, well I need you to leave earlier, so figure it out. I did. I did figure it out. The next day, as my manager liked to call it, we were slam a crazy busy. Dishes were even more backed up than ever before. At closing time, I told the serving staff and kitchen staff that I needed some help cleaning this up because the manager wanted me out of there earlier. They said, well, you can manage, and off they went. I decided I'd had enough. I left about 45 minutes worth of dishes uncleaned and took off at the appropriate time I was supposed to be done by. The next morning, the kitchen staff were quite upset because they obviously didn't have the things all finished and had to do some extra work to get it clean. My manager called me into the office to have a talk when I arrived later that day. So, 
You left earlier and left a bunch of stuff dirty in the dish pit. Is this going to be a problem? You told me to leave on time. I did the best I could. The options were stay later or leave on time and leave some dirty dishes behind for the morning staff to clean. Manager, you can't get those dishes done in that much time? Me, the dishwasher has a limited capacity, so that's the limit for some dishes, but pots and pans, things the kitchen uses mostly, can be hand washed more easily. The same is true for some of the serving staff stuff. In fact, a lot of that has to be hand washed regardless. Here's what happens. First, the front end gets slammed. Then the kitchen gets slammed, making the orders for all those customers. Then the customers leave and the serving staff do their thing and the kitchen starts to catch up. Then the kitchen gets caught up and serving staff starts heading home. Then the kitchen staff heads home and it's just me in the back, still dealing with the original big slam of customers we had earlier in the day. Here's what I can do. I can refuse to help them and 100% focus on making sure dishes are done. That may mean you need to have more serving staff come in to handle the load since I won't be helping. That also might mean you need to have the line cooks and or prep cooks stay longer to make sure the kitchen is kept up to pace through the busiest hours. If I'm just sticking to clearing tables and washing dishes, I can keep up and maintain everything fine. Manager. Okay, well do that. The rest of the restaurant didn't last a day before they were demanding my help during their rush times, clearly upset, and it was only a day after that the manager instructed them they needed to help me with washing dishes and we'd all leave together at the end of the night. They finally started to understand when they tried to help me get those dishes done. It changed everything. I of course returned the favor and all was well. Not long after that, I moved over to handling prep work, slicing and dicing and all that kind of thing. I also started handling food deliveries and so on. It was nice and I got paid more, but I found out pretty quick that the faster I did my job, the less I got paid. Unlike with dishes, there was a bit more fixed amount of work to do, so I was happy to help the dishwashers. I got so fast at one point that in the middle of the summer rush days, I'd just hang out in the dish pit and the dishwasher would have it so easy. The manager tried to have me do both dishwashing and prep work because otherwise I lost too many hours, but that situation and how I got past it is another story. Crazy religious aunt throws a statue at me when she finds out I'm an atheist. Cast. We've got me, my entitled aunt, my cool cousin, and my mom. Background. I come from a religious background, but I am an atheist. Mom and cool cousin knew that, but entitled aunt didn't. It was a Saturday evening. Cool cousin and entitled aunt came over to visit us because we just came back from abroad. So while mom and entitled aunt were chatting, me and cool cousin were playing Assassin's Creed. When we are almost done, entitled aunt barges in the room and begins watching us. Entitled Aunt. What is the game you are playing about? Cool Cousin. It's about taking out targets during the Third Crusade. Entitled Aunt. But OP, you know that these actions are forbidden in our religion. She believed that we were going to practice sorcery if we continued playing it. Me. It is in your religion. What do you mean, your religion? I stayed quiet, but Cool Cousin defended me and said, People can believe in whatever they want. An OP here decided to be an atheist. Entitled Aunt. OP, how dare you believe in the devil? Me. Actually, being an atheist means shut your mouth. Crazy cousin. Mom, that's enough. Just let him be. No, I'm not going to let that little jerk continue being lost. After all the yelling, my mom decided to intervene. Mom, enough Entitled Aunt. Every time you meet up with us, you try to convert us. Would you like it if I did the same to your kids? Entitled Aunt. OP is an atheist. Mom. So what? He's my son and I will love him no matter what. That's it. I've had enough. If you're going to let an evil little jerk live with you, I won't. Entitled Aunt grabbed a wooden statue and hurled it at me. It hit me in the eye and I went to the hospital. Cops were called and Entitled Aunt tried to justify her actions by saying that it was okay because I was an atheist. Obviously, that didn't work, and she had to pay us $3,000 for medical bills. Entitled Aunt never tried that stunt again, and of course, me and Cool Cousin stayed close to each other. P.S. Sorry if some phrases are a little bit off. I had to translate the argument to English. Have you ever had an entitled relative that you just couldn't stand? Boss wanted me to train my replacement, but I didn't even work there anymore. I used to work in a grocery store back in 2016. I was 16 to 17 at the time, 
I don't work retail anymore. But I wanted to share this story I still remember to this day. It was a pretty normal night right before the end of my shift. I was one of the few closers at my store. So it was just me, my supervisor, and a cashier. I worked the self-checkout slash customer service desk. My supervisor had just collected the tills and was in the back counting, and I was starting my rounds to take back the non-perishables that were left at the registers. I also might add that our store had terrible camera placement. Basically, it showed all the registers and the supervisor's office door, which is where the safe was. This is important for later. After putting up all of the items that were left at the registers, I did my final check of the store to make sure there were no misplaced or damaged items on the floor. I find a case of beer that was leaking in our beer slash wine section, and since I wasn't sure how damaged the bottom of the cardboard case was, I had to drag it to the front so I could inform my supervisor about the damaged item before taking it to the back. We kept a cart full of damaged items to be taken out by the morning crew. Since the supervisor's office is locked while they are counting the tills, I call over to her and let her know that there was a damaged case of beer and I was taking it to the back. She responds with an absent, Okay, sounds good. So I take it to the back and place it with the rest of the damaged items and go back to the front to see if there is anything else my supervisor needs me to do before I clock out. There isn't. Next couple of days are fine as I finish up the week and wait for the next week's schedule to be posted and I find out that I'm not scheduled for the next week. I figure there must have been a mistake as there was someone working at the same grocery store who shared my first name. I go upstairs to my manager's office and ask him about the schedule and why I wasn't scheduled. He responds with, Oh, my bad. I forgot to tell you that you are suspended until the investigation is over. By the way, can you train your replacement today on the self-checkout slash customer service desk? Me, confused and annoyed at the moment, don't really pay attention to the second part of his comment, I ask him what he was talking about. My manager, you were caught stealing that case of beer that you took to the back, and until the police investigation is complete, you won't be working here anymore. Please turn in your uniform, name tag, and badge. I am furious, but I decide that I would just go with a bit of MC in the situation. Well, boss man. I took the damaged case of beer to the back to be thrown out in the morning as per procedure. But since I won't be working here anymore, I guess you will just have to find someone else to train my replacement, since I clearly can't be trusted. I was the only person who could train someone for the customer service desk other than him. His jaw dropped. The look on his face was priceless as I took off my uniform and handed him my name tag and override card. I then proceeded to walk out, get in my car and drive home. About two years later, I joined the army, and I'm going for a job that required a security clearance. Guess what shows up? That suspension with an unfinished police report and the tapes from the security camera. I sit there with my interviewer as we watch the tape together, clearly showing that I did not steal anything. Needless to say, I was approved for my clearance. I ask if I can get a copy of the tape, and my interviewer agrees. It took two years, but I finally had the evidence I needed to sue for wrongful termination. But as the time is well over the statute of limitation, I am unable to actually do anything about it. Either way, I decide to go pay my old workplace a visit over my Christmas block leave and a couple people recognize me, including my old boss. He tells me that thieves like me aren't welcome in his store and that I need to leave or he would be calling the police. I told him to call them and that his claim would surely hold up when I showed them the copy of the video footage of me stealing. The store had one of my favorite muffins, and honestly, I really wanted one since they are only made there. The police got called and did nothing, and I got three muffins free of charge thanks to my favorite supervisor. Worth it. Guy who stole $2,000 worth of equipment from our store came back the same day we found out what he looked like. I work at a relatively new grocery store in a small town in Washington. We've only been open for around 9 months and our customer count has been going up recently, so it gets a bit harder to keep track of customers. I usually work as a cashier most of the week on the closing shift, but I'll also throw freight in the aisles at least 2 days a week. Anyways, here's the story. So in our stock room, we have 4 handheld scanners on docks ready to be used by employees and managers to check prices, print tags, etc. On St. Patrick's Day, we somehow lost 2 of them. These things are worth a lot of money, and at first, we thought two managers had just misplaced them. For the past month, 
they've been trying to track them with the tile trackers they put on each device and they've always shown to be just outside or even in our parking lot. The owners were obviously confused and have been trying to figure out what happened to them. Yesterday, I came in for my shift as the closing cashier. I grabbed my uniform from my locker, put on my face mask and grabbed my handset. As I'm in the front office getting my radio, one of the owners grabs my attention and shows me a printout of the security cameras. From now on, I'll just put them as Owner 1 and Owner 2. Owner 1. So, we just found out who took our handhelds. It turns out he just walked straight to the back and just took them off the docks and walked right back out. We're pretty sure you were on your break at that point. Did you see him? The break room is just inside of the stock room, but there aren't any windows or anything besides a slim one-way window on the door. Me. I didn't see him, but he does look familiar. I'll keep an eye out for him. Owner 2. If you see him, let us know. That's very valuable equipment he stole. Me. Yes, sir. I'll let you know if I see him. I walk out and clock in. So, I'm going about my normal shift. I count in my till. I do some facing around the store since there are two cashiers up front currently. Then it happens. 15 minutes after I switch out registers with the opening cashier, the guy walks right in and grabs a basket. At first, I didn't recognize him. Even on the picture, he just looked like any ordinary guy. Luckily, our front-end manager has years of experience, so she spotted him, no problem. So she goes and faces the area he's in, acting like she's making it look pretty, and he's really interested in the chicken, the chicken that's right next to the stock room. Anyways, a few minutes later, he comes up with a full basket of goodies as he's talking to me. I hear the manager telling owner too he's in my line and he's being rung up. I freeze for a second because, I mean, I couldn't say anything. Luckily, I had a mask on so he couldn't see the look of shock come across my face. Anyways, owner 2 comes up and is acting like he's helping me bag. Then he suddenly starts a conversation with him. Owner 2. Hey, have you come into this store before? Thief. Yeah, a few times. I'm a pretty frequent shopper. Owner 2. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, have you been here around March 17th? Thief immediately starts acting nervous. Uh, not that I know of. Owner 2. Alright. Stops bagging. Hang on one second, I'll be right back. Owner 2 went to the front office. I'm guessing to grab the printout they showed me earlier, and Thief is just sputtering. Suddenly, Thief just looks up, does a 180, and just starts walking out, in the middle of my transaction. I actually had to shut down my register so I didn't get a line going. So I then pull out my radio. The mic remote won't work, probably from the rain, and alert Owner 2 he's trying to walk out, and he just Usain bolts out the door after him, probably trying to ask him why he stole the handhelds. And then, as Owner 2 is getting the guy's license plate, Thief tried to run him over with his car, probably in view of the front surveillance camera. So the cops are called, charges are pressed, and now they know who he is. He's probably done this before now that I think about it, and I'm just in shock. Afterwards, I was profusely apologizing for not noticing it was him in the first place, but the manager just reassured me that I just didn't have experience in identifying people like that. She had around 9 years of experience to boot, that's why she was able to spot him. Anyways, let's hope there's an end to that whole deal and we can get our two handhelds back. Update. I forgot to mention that when he stole those handhelds, he did it with no hesitation and like he knew what he was doing. It was an insane breach of privacy and no one even noticed. Leave the store open with poo everywhere? Okay boss. So, while I was at university, I had a side job managing a team at a very popular sandwich branch. Myself, Joe, and Johnny would work the night shift, 8pm to 4am, and I would work Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night as the shop was opposite the only nightclub in town. Very upper class city during the day, but a very trashy nightlife. It would get so busy after 2am with drunks that queues would be out the door and we would have to put away tables and chairs to block the toilets, as people would either throw them at us or each other, or dash off to the toilets to do things they shouldn't be doing back there. This, however, happened at around 9pm. Nice and quiet time. Nothing interesting usually happens during this time, and the owner of the restaurant would call in every half hour to see how the shop is doing, because he's worried about losing money by requiring three whole employees to prepare for the night rush. A group of around 15 girls run in, all really drunk. Cool, serve them, get rid of them. Happens occasionally, but we still got some time before the mass comes. One of the larger girls 
collapses against the wall on the floor, looks passed out. Her friends don't take any notice, but we are all first aid trained. I get Joe to go check on her. She waves him off, shouts at him. Fine, back to work. 10 minutes later, the smell. Oh lord, the smell. The store is actually pretty busy, but after realizing what had happened, we had to stop serving and kick everybody out of the store because of the health hazard I was about to witness. We kick out her friends and she's still asleep. Myself and John lift her to a safe location while John calls an ambulance in case there's anything wrong. The smell gets worse as we lift her. I felt sick. I turned to look back and I saw the largest pile of literal crap. None of us wanted to go anywhere near it, but a joint effort between the three of us had it cleaned up within minutes. I wasn't going to risk anything, so I left the air on full blast and prepared to lock up for the rest of the night. Incoming phone call. It basically went down as, how's the store? We had an accident, so we had to close. What? Under no circumstances are you ever to close early. Yes, but- No buts! Open back up immediately, or I'll fire all three of you. We throw away anything perishable that wasn't covered. We didn't have a lot out, but still. Not risking anything else that could lose me my oh-so-precious part-time job. We then proceed to take a 30-minute break to let the store ventilate and have the smell go, like it would. Huge group of lads come to the store while we're outside and starts a fight with Joe because we were closed. I tell the lad what happened and why we were closed, but he was having none of it. Said he knew the owner and was a law student and would have me sued for false closure. Enlighten me. I can't get sued for something like this, can I? He calls the owner and surely enough, I immediately get a call back. Open the store now or I'll fire you on the spot. I tell him to wait up a couple of seconds while I deal with the customer. I tell Joe to start recording the call. Sorry, I didn't catch what you previously said. Could you repeat? Open the store or you're fired. I repeat our previous conversation explaining why I had closed the store and that it was a critical food hazard until it was cleaned properly. Most heavy duty cleaning materials that could have appropriately cleaned up the mess were locked away by the owner until morning because we wouldn't have time. I don't think you understood what I said, OP. Open the store. All right, will do, boss. So I continue to open the store. Customers start flooding in. I get all fresh ingredients out to start rushing through the humongous line we were amassing. A lot of customers are turning their noses once they walk in, but like I said, trashy. These people are hungry. They line up anyway. Some customers are throwing up from the smell. It was really that bad. Asked me what was up. I told them and told them that if I were to close, I would lose my job. Police show up and close up the shop for us. Thank God. I was waiting for something like this to happen. We didn't even have to clean up. We just got told to go home and they would sort it out with the owner tomorrow because the city had a reputation to uphold. I ended up getting fired because I closed the store. But instead of just getting fired, I ended up taking it to court for unfair dismissal and got a month's payout and the owner had an emergency health inspection the morning after. The guy lost his branch. He works as a security guard at a grocery store now, working for the security guard he previously hired to look after us after 1 a.m. Pretty sure he ended up losing his house and car too. Forget that guy. Entitled mom yells at me for drinking on my own porch. This happened yesterday. It was really nice out, so I thought I'd take a break from writing all my papers to sit out on my porch with a nice glass of wine. Since I live on the first floor of the complex, I have a small green patch where I have a bird feeder set up and some flowers. Past that is the public sidewalk, and there are no fences, so it's all pretty open. I take a chair out the sliding glass door onto the patio slash porch, leave the screen door closed so my cats can get a bit of the outdoor air, and plop down and pour myself a glass of Cabernet. At that point in the day, the sunlight was right on my porch, so my cats were laying in the sunbeam right behind me. As I'm just watching the day go by, seeing the occasional dog on a walk, or people just taking a stroll, a little kid about five or so came up into my view, trying to jump from sidewalk square to square. I hear the mom somewhere out of my line of sight say, Don't go too far ahead. So he stops where he is and looks around. He sees me and my cats in behind the screen. Look mom, he says. Those kitties are the same color as s'more. I guess his cat is also a calico. By this point, the mom catches up and glances in my direction to see what he's pointing at. Oh yeah? She says. 
Then she looks over to me and her tone quickly changes. What the heck are you doing? Me? I said, a bit thrown back. Yes, you. What do you think you're doing? You can't drink here. These are student dorms. These are actually just apartments, unaffiliated with the university. But since they're across from the campus, pretty much only students live here. So many think it's another dorm. Me. I'm over 21. No, you're not. These are student dorms. I guess she forgot that students can also be over 21. I'm pretty sure I'm over 21. Don't you talk back to me. Get rid of that drink right now. You can't drink in public. I guess she decided to switch gears on how to get rid of my drink. She starts walking towards me. Her kid comes to, I guess wanting a closer look at my cats. Lady, I'm on my own porch. I can drink wine if I want. She clearly didn't like me talking back. She got angry. I said get rid of that drink. She continued to approach, yelling at me like I'm her kid and I won't put my toys away. By that point, the kid was on my porch looking at my cats through the porch screen. Uh, no. I take a sip. Get rid of it or I'm taking it. By this point, she's right in front of me, face red, hands on her hips, looming over me like that's going to work on a 26-year-old. No, now get off my porch, I said, standing up with my voice raised. By then, the cats had run off and the boy was bummed. We continued to stare down each other. I'm on my own porch. I'm not hurting anyone and I'm 26. I'll drink on my porch if I want. I take another swig in front of her. Entitled mom then smacks the wine out of my hand and it nearly lands on her kid as it shatters on the floor. What the heck, lady? I told you to get rid of that drink, she yells not at all worried that the drink could have hit him. Forget you! I shoved her and tried to pick up the big pieces so he wouldn't get cut by them. He was wearing sandals. Her kid runs off back to the sidewalk. How dare you push me? How dare you destroy my property? Get the heck off my porch or... I started waving around the broken glass pieces and she took that as a threat. Are you threatening me? I actually wasn't. I just get expressive with my hands when I'm mad, and I happen to have the broken glass in them. But by this point, I'm fed up with this jerk. Yes! Now get off my property! By this point, we had attracted a couple of onlookers, which Entitled Mom finally noticed. She looked around and saw a couple on the sidewalk gawking at her, as well as my neighbor sitting on his porch nearby. She looks around. Her face, which was red with anger, was now red with embarrassment. She huffs and puffs, and spins around grabbing her kid's hand and speed walks away from all of us as fast as she can. My neighbor asked if I was okay. I said I was fine, just annoyed. I swept up the broken glass, went back inside, poured another glass, and watched some JoJo to get my mind off things. Weird jerk. Entitled parent at my work demands that I pay for her and her kids to rock climb. Backstory. I work at a rock climbing gym. As an employee, I get a free membership. I get to climb for free, and I get two guest passes that are renewed 30 days after being used. I had already used both passes to climb with some friends. This is relevant later. I was working a nice morning shift. All the regular early customers had pretty much been signed in and paid for, and then Karen, entitled parent, walked in with a few of her kids. I actually recognized her. I was friends with her oldest son a long time ago, but I hadn't seen their family since the fourth grade, and she didn't recognize me, so I stayed quiet. The first register on the right side of the front desk was taken by another customer, so I called her over to the register on the left. For whatever reason, the left register only accepts card, no cash, just remember that. Entitled parent walks up, tells me what she needs to buy, what gear to rent, etc. When it's time for her to pay, she pulls out several $20 bills. Me. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it. This register doesn't accept cash. Do you have a card? Entitled parent looks at me like some pawn scum just started speaking to her. What? What are you even talking about? This little sign says pay with cash to support local businesses. I'm trying to support local businesses and your sign is totally wrong. So I would just take that down. Looking at her, I couldn't help but think, oh, you poor, poor rich woman. You have to put your wad of cash back in your nice purse. How sad. Anyway, I probably said something epically clever as an apology like, uh, sorry. So she stuffs her money back in her purse and pulls out some coupons. But you aren't allowed to combine coupons of the same deal for the same purchase, something like that. So I told her, and then she gave me this talk about customer service and told me all about how my rules were wrong. My rules? 
I have the lowest possible position of the employees. The rules aren't mine. So I just gave her her way and let her use her gift cards. But she wasn't done. The rest of her rant went something like this. Listen, buddy. I've been standing here far too long. My kids just want to climb. First you trick me with your stupid sign trying to get my cash. And then you tell me my coupons aren't valid? This customer service is terrible. Can you give me a cashier who doesn't act stupid? Do you have a membership here? I was getting a little upset. It was a weird way to end her little speech, but I told her I was a member. So that means you have some free passes. I read your website. For all the trouble you just caused me, you need to use your passes on me and my kids. And you should also pay for our climbing gear. Me. What? Well, I only have two, and they are already used, and you can't ask me to pay for you. I actually have used my passes to pay for families who were a couple dollars short. But again, I didn't have any, and this lady was just the worst. I have the lowest position the job offers, and I'm not allowed to ask people to leave the gym. What did you say to me, you little jerk? My kids rock climb all the time. They're good enough that you should pay for them. How dare you tell me what I can't do? Take me to your manager, boy. I'm going to get you fired, and I'm going to make you pay for us. Basically, her logic in her speech was that I didn't have kids, and I'm the one with the job, so I should just pay for her. I actually didn't know what to say. The climbing community is extremely friendly, so I have never had a rude customer come in. She poked her head behind the desk and grabbed the computers towards her so she could look at it and tell me how to give her my passes, and I grabbed the computer and told her to stop. Assault! I'm reporting you. Me. That is an assault. You sure can speak to my boss. I would love to see what she has to say. She kept going on and on, and I had kept calm the whole time, but I told her to shut up. I don't remember what she said. She was going crazy yelling. We got to my boss. I started explaining what happened, but she cut me off. No. First he wouldn't let me pay. He assaulted me and made fun of my kids. You need to make him pay for me and my kids to climb. My boss calmed her down, and I told my boss exactly what happened. And sure enough, my coworker confirmed I was right, and my boss checked the cameras and saw exactly what happened. Entitled parent was asked to leave, was not banned from the facility, but was asked to not come back. I actually just feel bad about this whole thing. Like I said, I used to be friends with her son, and it's a rather bitter memory now. For the record, they're mostly a very nice family, and I even saw one of her kids tell her she was being rude during the whole thing, even though she was acting really stupid. I don't hate her, but I would prefer not to see her again. Hope you enjoyed this. I didn't. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.